Are you ready for your next great Civil War read? Then try the new historical novel, The Heavens Falling, by Jonathan Lucci. Follow the members of the Dawson family through the Civil War, from the halls of Congress to the bloody fields of battle, and from the decks of gunboats to the solitude of Lincoln's office. The Heavens Falling is available on Amazon in paperback and Kindle, or visit theheavensfalling.com to order. That's theheavensfalling.com. This episode of Addressing Gettysburg is brought to you in part by me, audiobook narrator Mike Scott, narrator of Savas Beattie's Bloody Autumn, the Shenandoah Valley Campaign of 1864, and, unlike anything that ever floated, The Monitor and Virginia and the Battle of Hampton Roads. If you are an author or publisher interested in having your titles produced as audiobooks, or even just in learning more about the process, give me a shout. You can find my contact info on my website, mikescottvoice.com. That's mikescottvoice.com. Com. Want the freshest cup of coffee in Gettysburg? Then visit Bantam Roasters, formerly 82 Cafe at 82 Steinware Avenue. They roast all of their coffee in-house, and they have a full coffee bar to keep you caffeinated during your trip. Visit them at www.raggededgerc.com for their menu and shipping options for all of their freshly roasted coffee. Use promo code HANCOCK for 10% off your order in the cafe. Hi, this is Jim Hessler, author and co-host of the Battle of Gettysburg podcast, and you're listening to Addressing Gettysburg. From the Gettysburg Museum of History Studios, you're listening to Addressing Gettysburg. That's a little louder than I planned it to be. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this episode of Addressing Gettysburg's Ask a Gettysburg Guide. And today, we are talking about Hancock at Gettysburg on July 2nd. Day two of the battle. And with me is licensed battlefield guide Mike Rupert. Hello, Mike. Hello there. Is this microphone yeah, that's, in the right place? No, it needs to be near your mouth, not near your ear. <laughs> what a, all it's, right. Let's get this thing it's set like you're up like here. Off, you're off to the side. You're like, can you hear me now? <laughs> All right. All right. Hey, so, I don't do this all the time. I know, I know, I know. This is what, your second time on the show? I, well, I guess third time, but we did one one out on the field at the Rose Farm. Oh, that's right. right. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Um, all right. So this is your second time in the studio, and yes. um, this is... Uh, this is uh, we're about to move the studio, so this uh, you're the last uh, Ask a Guide recorded in the studio. Mm. And then tomorrow we have our last AG today, and uh, then it's done, and then we're going to go set up the new place. But by the time this comes out, we'll already be in the new place, and people will be like, why are you even talking about this now? So let's, let's listen to them and move on here. So ladies and gentlemen, don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. We're going to start um, building up our YouTube channel more and start producing videos. So go over there and subscribe to us. Uh, click the notification bell so that you get notified when we post or go live or whatever. And also, if you use the Apple Podcast app, please leave a five-star review. Reviews, liking, sharing, and subscribing are the best ways to help us grow our audience. All right. So, Hancock, his movements and actions on day two. Yes. Um Qualification here. Yeah, this is this is audio only. Cause, Correct. Because it's it's hard to figure out what show is what. I know. Well, yeah. you would see yourself on the monitor <laughs> behind me if this well, was video. I, ga- I gathered that much. Okay. <laughs> All right. No problem. Yeah. So, but and that's a good point, though. Uh, those of you who have a map book, uh, whether it's the Leno book or uh, Brad Godfrey's book. Uh, you know, it always helps to pull it out and uh, l- look along with us if you can. Uh, of course, yeah. if you're driving, don't do that, you know. But uh, <laughs> try to, you should always study the maps of uh, Gettysburg if you're a student of the battle, because you need to know where things are in relation to things. But uh, we're going to talk mainly about Hancock on July 2. Two. Yes, yes. Um, and so his assigned position and his corps' assigned position is uh, the center of the line. So, like the Cemetery Ridge area from like the Bryan House. Well, or I would what, say Ziegler's the northern Grove? Cemetery Ridge line, he's going to pick up where the 11th Corps has the bend there on Cemetery Hill, so he's right adjacent to them. He's on their left, and they are on his right, and then he goes down the ridge, of course, too. Well, initially, with uh, Caldwell, he's past the Pennsylvania Monument. Okay. But, of course, that's all going to change on day two quite quickly. Yes. And, and uh, well, I guess let's let's back up a little before yeah. day two, uh, the end of July 1st, okay, day I kinda, one. I kind of wanted to uh, back up a little bit more. Okay. Well, you, you're, the, you're the guide, <laughs> so guide me. Where do you want to go? Where I want to go first is I want to talk about this man that we are talking about. And that's Winfield Scott Hancock. A little bit of background, if you will. All right. Uh, basic stuff. And 
whenever um, Hancock is born, he actually has a twin brother named um, Hillary. Uh, Hillary? Yeah, Hillary Baker. Now, uh, we must have gotten picked on a lot. Um, even though he's a twin brother, they grew up and they had a, from what I understand, their boyhood was uh, pretty good being brothers and all that sort of thing. He does have a younger brother, John, as well. Uh, born in uh, Montgomery uh, County, which is uh, kind of north of Philadelphia, if mm-hmm. you will. Um, his father uh, was Benjamin Franklin um, Hancock, and so... So th- this was a very patriotic family. Yes. That John Hancock, yes. Benjamin you know Franklin some, Hancock. Yes. So you know how some people have the uh, names like George Washington Carver? And right. They're going to be named after the founders. Okay. Now, crazy enough, even though... Uh, Winfield Scott's namesake is, of course, Winfield Scott. He had um, done well at a couple early battles in the War of 1812. That's how Winfield Scott first got his reputation. And oddly enough, the uh, parents picked the right kid to give the name to, okay? <laughs> because Hillary Baker winds up being in, uh, winds up going to, uh, moving to Minneapolis and becoming a lawyer uh, with a drinking problem. Uh-huh. Okay? Whereas mm. Hancock is, th- is military all the way. Yeah. Okay? No drinking problem. No drinking problem. And okay. so I just wanted to, I just, th- this is one of the better descriptions we have of Hancock so you can get the idea of this man that we're going to be talking about. This is, this comes from a, one of the staff officers with the Army of the Potomac, Frank Haskell. And uh, Hancock certainly looked apart. This is a quote here. Six, uh, six foot two, Second Corps artillery chief. Hancock was, in many respects, the best looking, dignified, and gentlemanly and commanding. He was tall and well proportioned, had a ruddy complexion, brown hair, and he wore a mustache and a tuft of hair upon his chin. Kind of, well, <laughs> Almost. Less, yeah, his, his beard is going to be shaved a little bit more, more neatly than yours. Is, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> I only shave once a week. <laughs> and had Jan- and this is another thing. This is a very familiar quote here. Had General Hancock worn citizens' clothes and given commands in the army to those who did not know him, he would have been likely obeyed at once, for he had the appearance of a man born to command. Commanding presence. Yes. And another thing, his officers and, of course, the people in his corps uh, always felt safe whenever he was nearby. So this is the commanding presence that that he does have, which I think is very important here and is going to lead to his... uh, proven abilities on the field. It's going to start way back at the uh, in um, the Peninsula Campaign. Mm-hmm. Where does he get the nickname Hancock the Suburb? That, that comes from May 5th and 62, whenever at the Battle of um, Williamsburg, he's going to wind up uh, occupying redoubts that were recently vac- vacated by another part of the Union Army. He takes these, and then he leads a counterattack against the Confederates. And then McClellan's going to write to his wife later that, you know, Hancock was superb today. Mm. So that's where the term Hancock the Suburb comes from. By the way, that superb action on the battlefield continues, okay? So he's going to keep can keep getting these accolades. He's going to be well-known um, as far as being able to command in the field. George Meade himself is going to uh, write about him. Uh, in the, in, of course, Meade's still alive. But um, later on, that uh, Hancock is one of the Corps commanders who always went in whenever he said to. So he didn't have any issues with anything that Hancock was going to do. So they did have that working relationship already. All right. So we have here, he does wind up going to West Point. He's in the class of 1844. And in this West Point class, his, uh, one of his classmates is going to be one of his division commanders here at Gettysburg, um, Alexander Hayes. Hayes is uh, a rather large man, um, if you will. He likes to get into the fight. He's kind of got that lion mentality, if you will. But again, that's one of uh, Hancock's division commanders here at Gettysburg. So let's move up. Everybody is pretty much familiar with the, uh, the battle up on the day one. We're going to start there, as Matt had requested. And <laughs> on day one... What's going on here? How does Hancock wind up um, coming onto the battlefield here? It's yes. going to wind up being at the request, of course, of uh, George Meade. Uh, early in the day, we've got to remember, Hancock is still down in um, Tawnytown with, where George Meade and his headquarters are set up. At this point in time, the only elements up here in Gettysburg will be Buford's Cavalry, 
the 1st and the 11th Corps. Of course, they're going to get beat back here on um, day one. And as they get beat back here, uh, during that time, George Meade, who commands the Army, finds out somewhere probably just before noon that his man in charge up here is dead. Okay, that's John Reynolds. Now, as far as Reynolds goes, the reason why he was in this position, because Reynolds was the one who could decide that as they would approach any given area, should we fight here or should we fall back? Everybody's familiar with George Meade working out um, this whole Pipe Creek line thing where he wanted to fight the Confederates along uh, pipe, Big Pipe Creek in Maryland. But nonetheless, things are going to change very quickly here at Gettysburg whenever the fight escalates throughout the day. I mean, by the end of the day, you've got 50,000 men engaged here. Union Army outnumbered by 10,000. They get pushed back to Cemetery Hill. However, George Meade has to decide, once he finds out that Reynolds is dead, is Gettysburg a good place to fight or not? And at that, he's going to wind up summoning Winfield Scott Hancock to his tent. And just before this, this is in Tawnytown, Maryland, around lunchtime on day one, he had already discussed with Hancock his intentions and what his plans were going to be, okay? And a lot of people think that, you know, while senior commander's on the field, you know, that's who should get the command. But um, whenever Lincoln gives uh, me Me. command of this army— he is going to tell him that he has full reign to ignore all that seniority stuff. And Meade is going to do it by the droves. Mm-hmm. Okay? And he's going to make a lot of brigade commanders and other division commanders a little bit uh, kind of annoyed, if you will. But nonetheless, Hancock was the only one who Meade trusted at this point in time. So guess what? He's going to get sent to Gettysburg. See the condition of the uh, troops there. Also, really to decide, is Gettysburg a good place to fight or not? Do you, do you think, sorry, do you Go think ahead. proximity has anything to do with why it chose Hancock? Because he's there. They're both in Tawnytown. No, I think it's because they had just before he got the word that Reynolds was dead, that um, he had just had a discussion with Winfield Scott Hancock. And they already had that previous um, relationship. So they, Mm -hmm. in earlier battles, they had worked together, division commanders, whatever it is. So they already had a working relationship. And once you get, and this is important, once you get to upper levels of command, you really only want to work with people who you have a relationship with and people whom you actually trust. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. So that's... The only guy who fits a bill there is going to be Hancock. Mm -hmm. Okay, So that's why he's going to wind up sending him up here to Gettysburg. The other thing that I think is important to mention for those who don't know is that Hancock um, is new to Corps Command. Oh, yes, he is new to Corps Command. Oh, yeah. Let's go over over that. See, this could be like a 40-hour program. (laughs) So you wanted to go further back, but you didn't go to that part. You skipped that part. So, all right. So, but real quick, though. So he was, uh, what, at Chancellorsville, he was a division commander. Uh, uh, yes. Mm-hmm. And then uh, Hooker so disgusts Darius Couch, Couch yes. that Couch resigns, resigns and Hancock moves up. Yes, and Hancock is going to be uh, chosen to command. And by the way, if I'm not mistaken, it's actually um, Abraham Lincoln who wants Hancock in command of that second okay. corps. Okay, all right. Um, which is, uh, says a lot. He already has a reputation. But now, Hancock's a Democrat, though. Hancock, it, yes, he is a Democrat. Um, however, he's not one of those... Um, Partisan types. Yeah, yeah, yeah. where you're, he's going to be uh, confrontational and all that kind of stuff. Okay. And George Meade, who does command the Army, he's a Democrat, too. One of the McClellan Democrats, if you will. Mm-hmm. But nonetheless, Meade is more apolitical, even though he's de- a Democrat. Yeah, so, okay. They're yeah, real Americans. Because Hancock's family, his parents came from that uh, Jacksonian uh, Democrat philosophy, if you will. Mm-hmm. Okay. okay. So, all right, so uh, so he so and and between Chancellorsville and here, how many major battles did he command that corps in? Um, between Chancellorsville and Gettysburg, yeah, the second corps. Is yeah. this a trick question? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My point is none, right? Right. Correct. He, he doesn't new to corps command. He's there new to go. corps command, and this is his first major battle. Yes. And what a doozy of a major battle for this to be your first. Mm-hmm. All right. So he's being sent up here. Yes. Uh, and Howard is in command of the field and outranks him, even though they're the same rank, but he has seniority. Correct. Right. Yes. yes. But Meade sends him with orders. Written orders Mm -hmm. saying Hancock's in charge. Yeah. In one of our our questions later, I have more detail on that whole um, supposed 
Howard Hancock controversy. Okay. okay? So we'll cover it. We'll, we'll go into right, that later. Right, yeah, we'll you lead the way. The, we'll go into the nuts and bolts there later, but let's let's get Hancock on the field. Okay. So Hancock's going to arrive. By the way, Hancock's after action report and the official records, he says that he got here somewhere around 3 o'clock. That doesn't make any sense. Most Once you put all the different accounts together, it's more like the 4.30-ish time frame. Okay. Whenever he arrives, both first and 11th Corps already falling back through the town, already taking and forming new lines on uh, Cemetery Hill. When Hancock arrives, of course, he's going to wind up going up to um, the East Cemetery Hill area. He's going to run into uh, General Howard. He's going to inform him of the command seniority thing and that he's going to be in command of the field. And for practical purposes right now, we're going to say that it was really no big deal, okay? Howard's going to uh, set up the troops on East Cemetery Hill and the northern slope, if you will, and and, uh, Hancock is going to take, of course, the other side and start forming the western side of Cemetery Hill, if you will, Okay. with what's left. Mm -hmm. Oh, Hancock is also going to set up troops on the um, Culp's Hill side, I'm sorry, Stevens Battery, and then, of course, um, he's going to order Wadsworth, what's left of it, over there as well. So he's going to kind of start starting at Thin Line from Cemetery Hill, uh, East Cemetery Hill, over to the Culp's Hill area. Okay. Okay. Uh, does, is he the one that sends the 7th Indiana over there too? 7th Indiana. They, um, 7th Indiana, I don't know specifically why they, uh, uh, who sent them over there, but the 7th Indiana story is one of my favorites. Go ahead. Because you have um, a commander there, Ira Grover. Um, he's, that's Lysander Cutler's brigade. Right. Okay, that's going to be Wadsworth's division. But they there. weren't involved in right. the they action. Right, back in Emmitsburg guarding wagons. Right. And Ira is one of those guys um, who kind of takes uh, initiative and does things on his own. He decides to abandon those wagons sometime in the during the day on day one because he knows that he already heard that his men, or I should say his uh, comrades and his uh, brigade were already uh, fighting at Gettysburg, and he wanted to get up here. Whenever Ira does get here, he's got 435 fresh men of the 7th Indiana. Mm. By this time, uh, Wadsworth's what's left of the division is all between Meredith and... And Cutler, they're already strung out on the uh, kind of like bridging Stevens Knoll. Well, what was that McKnight's Knoll uh, from East Cemetery Hill, McKnight's Knoll over to the crest of Upper Culp's Hill. Remember, mm-hmm. Culp's Hill is mm-hmm. two hills, Upper and Lower. And the Seventh Indiana, these fresh guys are going to be put out onto the end. And as they go to the end of the line, uh, the rest of uh, Cutler's brigade, of course, is absolutely delighted to see them. They got nearly 50 percent casualties. Well. Um, Ira Grover and his men from Indiana are fresh. Hmm. And this plays a part here at the end of the fighting on day one, because what's going to wind up happening uh, whenever General Lee gives those uh, the discretionary will take the hill of practical, blah, 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 all that stuff. Whenever he gives that, um, Yule sends up scouts and Upper Culp's Hill is still empty at this time. OK, this is probably going to be before it gets gets dark. Once it starts to get near dark, Yule is going to tell Allegheny Johnson, who's just arriving on the field. His men aren't here yet. The whole division really doesn't arrive till after dark. But uh, his staff starts to arrive and they're going to want and Allegheny Johnson under Yule wants to scout his own position where he's told to go. So he sends up that scouting party. Seventh Indiana is going to hear them coming up Culp's Hill. They're going to kind of separate. They're going to have like in a little ambush area for these uh, Johnson scouts to walk into. There's a short firefight there. And not my guess, by guess, is this is going to be somewhere whenever it's getting near dark, you know, pushing around the mm-hmm. 8 o'clock time frame. Mm-hmm. Remember, no daylight savings mm-hmm. time. Mm-hmm. 10 after 8, it's dark. Right about that time, firefight, some of the Johnson scouts get killed, uh, some get captured, but at least two make it back to Allegheny Johnson, and they tell him that the hill is heavily fortified. Mm-hmm. There was nobody to the 7th Indiana's right, and nobody behind them either on the upper part of Culp's Hill. Right. So this is one of those situations. You have somebody taking the initiative to do something, and it's here. It's Ira Grover uh, late in the day on day one. Mm, so that's, that's an important uh, piece of... Uh information there for those people who are like, why didn't Yule take... Yeah, yeah. Because he's, oh, yeah. he's... Yule's getting... And we talk about this a lot. Yule is getting a lot of information coming in about Union troops. Um, he's, you know, I think it's what, William's division on the yeah, left? Yeah, over there on the York Pike. Yeah. Um, yeah, that whole thing. And remember, and this whole... And it ultimately comes down to this, the reason why the battle happens here at Gettysburg. Of course, you have the road network to draw the men together. But General Lee, being absent of Stewart's intelligence from June 25th all the way to the end of the second day, plays a huge part. That's why the battle happens here. 
Was it was it the York Pike or the Hanover Road? I always both, get it confused. Well, the, actually, both of those roads are going to be wind up occupying occupied by Confederate infantry. Right. Okay. But, but because of a threat of because Union of troops. Because of the threat, yeah. Because yeah. uh, extra Billy Smith saw he that he thought he saw something out there, and so then Gordon goes out there as well, mm. and so you start. You know, we don't have any guys to continue to press this attack here. Right. So you've got. And this isn't about Yule. We've talked about this over and over again on the show. But for those people who are just listening for the first time, you know, you've got Yule is hearing about troops on his left, uh, Union troops on his left. And he's got these orders from Lee saying to take the hill if practicable. But and there, what? But there's a but. Don't bring on a general engagement. Oh, yeah. That old thing. Mm-hmm. Right. Don't bring on a general engagement. And then uh, he's got his his uh, reconnoitering guys coming back saying, oh, yeah, they're heavily fortified up on that hill. Yeah. And so uh, what and then not only that, but his whole core, or at least the divisions that were in the fight. Uh, well, really. Early. Yeah. But they're all oh, they're, they're, beat they're beat up. Oh, yes, they are. They're they're scattered all over the place because yep. they came through town chasing the Yankees. Right. And I'm sure some guys stop yep. for a meal and you know. breaks up everything. Yeah. yeah. So he doesn't have it's not like he's got his full force that he woke up with that morning. No, it's just as much a mess as anybody else that yep. was fighting on July 1st. Yeah. So uh, I think people need to go easy on Yule. Absolutely. Yeah. I think you was right in not, quote, taking the hill. Yeah. I mean, only we know now that he probably could have easily brushed aside the 7th Indiana. That's Cold Hill, not Cemetery Hill. That's true. you got to designate. Yes, okay. that's a great point, too. Right. Because the, the hill beyond the town, the heights beyond the town, Lee's referring to Cemetery Hill, right? Uh, that's the general understanding. But is it? It's one of those big, you know, what ifs. Could have been either hill. I mean, they're kind of both... You can't. To me, you can't have one without the other. If you if you hold Cemetery Hill, it's useless if you don't secure Culp's Hill. Exactly, which is why the Union Army, especially Hancock, whenever he arrives, Stevens' battery goes over there. What's yeah. left of the First Corps goes over there. Yes. Yeah. So Hancock uh, thinks like me. You know, great minds. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So moving on then. So Hancock's up here. He comes up on the evening of the first mm-hmm. with orders from Meade. Hancock's in charge. In charge or? He's in command of the field. So, okay. yeah, he's in charge so of he's everything. So he's in command, um, obviously, until Meade arrives. Well, he's going to wind up actually going. Uh, Slocum is five miles away down the Baltimore Pike in two taverns. Once we start to get towards the uh, latter part of the uh, day one, Slocum comes on the field, and Slocum is going to take over by way of seniority over um, Howard here, because me or not Meade, Hancock is going to wind up going back to Tawny Town. Okay, so Hancock's only up here briefly. Mm-hmm. He leaves. He probably leaves as it's getting dark on day one. Okay, and then so Slocum comes over and takes over because he outranks uh, Howard. Howard and um, well, and double Hancock's day, leaving. And double day. Well, and double du- days. Well, yeah, double day as well. But double day is going to be replaced very quickly by Meade by the misinformation that gets back. By the way, part of that whole uh, Howard-Hancock controversy comes from Doubleday himself, but we'll get into that Uh, a little bit later. All right. So uh, then Slocum's in command, and then uh, Hancock goes back to be, I guess, with his corps and bring them up. Is that right? Well, they're already on the way here. Oh, okay. okay. They're already on the way, or he goes back to Tawny Town to report in person to George Meade. Aha. Uh-huh. Okay, but he does wind up coming back very early in the morning. Uh, most accounts seem to say that he's going to be here around the seven, eight o'clock time frame, and he's going to be positioning, of course, his divisions on the uh, cemetery ridge line. Okay. All right, and then so the next day comes, and the second corps is up. Hancock arrives. Mm-hmm. What's it like for him at that okay. point? Initially, whenever Hancock does arrive, he's going to, well, I should say before he goes back down on the evening of the 1st, he's going to order um, his uh, men to be on the Tawny Town Road right in that area. He's going to kind of camp out there south of Gettysburg because he's still worried. And he says this uh, before about he's worried about the flank being turned. Okay? Mm. So he wanted to have some troops back there on the Tawny Town Road. But once the morning of the 2nd comes, everything's okay. We're going to keep building up our lines. Hancock is going to take... Um, 
Alexander Hayes Division, and they're going to connect with the 11th Corps, Mm -hmm. and they're going to go from western part of Cemetery Hill. They're going to move down past the Abraham Bryan Farm um, to about the Angle. And then right at the Angle, it's going to be Gibbons Division who takes over. And then Gibbon is going to go all the way down to about where the Pennsylvania Monument is. Okay. Okay. And then from the Pennsylvania Monument to the uh, George Weikert Farm, uh, right there on Cemetery Ridge, that's where Caldwell's division is going to be. Okay. So that's how they're going to be in position there. All right. <clears throat> and then um, some guy, Daniel Sickles. <laughs> <laughs> Who's that? <laughs> <laughs> he decides he's going to move his corps out to the Emmitsburg Road. Mm-hmm. And uh, Hancock has a famous line when uh, observing that, right? Oh, yeah. You'll see, soon see them come tumbling back. Yes. And um, so, but Sickles doing that kind of creates some chaos, mm-hmm. um, which probably would have occurred anyway because the Confederates were attacking Longstreet's Corps. The well, Confederates were about to attack. They're about to, but I'm saying that they're, they were moving down there oh, on yeah. the attack. Yes. The purpose was to attack. So either way, you were going to have chaos. It's just not where the Confederates planned it to be mm-hmm. because of Sickles' move. Not where the Union planned it to be either. Uh, correct. <laughs> and so um, this ends up sucking uh, some of uh, Hancock's men down there, right? A yes, lot of it is. And the, um, I think one of your uh, questions, too, was about the, uh, that situation there and that whole quote and the way it works. Hancock's Knoll, as we call it, you might call it Kadori Knoll. Um, that's another name for it, that same area. It's a great observation point at that point in the battle. Hancock does spend a lot of time in and around that area. Mm-hmm. He was there. This is early afternoon on day two, whenever um, he's there with Gibbon, some staff officers, and they. the word that I would use is absolutely dumbfounded and confounded whenever they see Humphrey's division because uh, Bernie's division is already out there by the peach orchard. Okay. And he sees Humphrey's now coming up and going out there. They have they knew nothing about the orders. They just left um, a meeting with uh, George Meade, of course, at the headquarters there. Sickles wasn't there because he's got a disaster brewing up by the Emmitsburg Road in the peach orchard. So they knew nothing about any orders for Sickles to be moving his men out there. Uh-huh. And they are. And the word that I would use there is they are absolutely dumbfounded themselves and really have no idea what it means. <laughs> okay. Okay. So they're all confused. Yes. Yes. <laughs> of course. Okay. And then Sickles is going to, of course, once he does become under attack, is going to uh, start asking for help. And he's going to get help from, uh, well, I guess it would be uh, Hancock's men first, right? Because they're the closest. Yeah, they're going to they're gonna wind up being the closest, when, of course. Now, whenever the Confederates attack, this is important, too. Um, it's not just a peach orchard. I mean, the fight starts, you know, down by Devil's Den, Little Round Top, that area first, then very quickly moves into the wheat field. And the wheat field winds up being, um, I've heard other uh folks describe it as being the back door to Dan Sickles at the Peach Orchard kind mm-hmm. of thing because if the Confederates get the weed field then they can come in behind oh, yeah. um, the uh, Peach Orchard area there so that area is going to be fought over quite violently for that three hours from 4.30 till about 7.30 and uh, the bulk of um, Hancock's men actually are going to wind up going into the weed field, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. But because before that happens, George Meade himself is going to find out that um, everybody's buddy Dan had moved out to the Emmitsburg Road and the Peach Orchard, and Meade is absolutely furious, and he's going to wind up ordering Sykes of the Fifth Corps to support, of course, Sickles and the mess that's being created there. Mm. Keep in mind, it's going to be the 5th Corps that saves Little Roundtop. You're going to have a lot of men from the 5th Corps wind up going into that wheat field fight. Mm-hmm. And then, um, then then, after this wheat field fight's already going on, we already have the fight going on between Little Roundtop and, of course, the Devil's Den area. The wheat field is going to be the whirlwind. We're going to have some back and forth. And then part of that in that back and forth is whenever... Um, uh, they're going to be ordered. I believe it's Meade who's going to wind up ordering uh, General Hancock to send a division to Sykes, okay, not to Sickles, okay, because mm-hmm. he certainly didn't want to give Sickles uh, charge of any more men. Mm-hmm. So that tells me, number one, that George Meade, 
even though George Sykes wasn't an outstanding commander, he's somewhat competent. If he's going to give him one of Hancock's divisions, he's somewhat competent. And he's going to be in and around that wheat field fight. And so Hancock, of course, sends Caldwell. Why? Because Caldwell is the closest one, just like you said there. Okay. Okay. Now, as they were getting ready to move there, and we always got to got to bring in um, this kind of a situation as well. And I'm probably forgetting a bunch of things too, but um, because I'm sure someone will remind us in the yeah, comment yeah, section. Because I didn't I didn't do an outline. I probably should have done an outline, but the outline would have been forty pages long. Yeah. So usually when you prepare, you end up overdoing it, and then when you get to doing the show, you you, you want to stick to everything, and then it goes on forever. So it's a good. We're just giving everybody a taste okay. here. Right, Don't worry about taste. it. So, they got to go get a book and read. Okay. Yes. By the way, I do have recommendations here. All right. We'll get to those in the end. Okay. Those are good ones. Yes. Um, so Caldwell is going to be wind up going to the um, sent towards the wheat field. However, before they go. The whole situation um, with Father Corby is going to wind up happening, and Father Corby is going to wind up asking, you know, the uh, permission to have a quick uh, prayer service. Everybody stops. It is reported that Hancock himself is going to stop, take off his hat, while Father Corby gives the men of the uh, Codwell's division there the absolution. Absolution mm-hmm. means forgiveness, okay? And uh, Thank you. especially for everybody who is. Um, not going to make it out of there. Mm-hmm. But you also, you can't turn your back on the enemy either. So Father Corby kind of incorporated that into his uh, prayer service, oh, wow. if you will, to inspire the men, if you will. So with that, once uh, Father Corby was done, um, Hancock is down there. By the way, I think one of the other questions, too, on one of your comments thing was how far down did Hancock go on the Cemetery Ridge line? I would place Hancock right there somewhere near um, Father Corby, which is just uh, slightly north on Cemetery Ridge of where the uh, George Weikert farm is. Okay. Okay, so right in that area there. So Hancock, I, we place him there. Uh, Caldwell. John Caldwell is, uh, of course, his first division commander. He's not one of those super inspiring kind of guys, but he's competent enough. And Caldwell does lead. He's got four brigades. Actually, the only, that's another uh, question mm, here, mm. only uh, division in the um, Army of the Potomac that actually has four brigades. So wait, don't tell me. Um, if the colors are red, white, and blue for first, second, and third, is the fourth green? Um, no, no the, it's, it's, sha- it's shaped uh, differently. Oh. I think it's shaped differently. Yeah, see, that's a test question. Sh- I don't know. What, you mean the, the core I, the, badge the, the is brigade, shaped? No, the brigade flag is shaped differently. Oh, I don't care about the brigade flag. Oh, <laughs> what do you care about? I'm asking the colors. I think that doesn't happen to the division level. Somebody will correct us on that. Wait, no, wait, we're talking about... No, we're talking oh, about oh, brigades. Oh, 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 we're talking about brigade. brigade. You know what? That's my fault. I'm cutting that out so I don't look stupid. <laughs> 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 yeah, I was thinking division. So you're right. Okay. okay. Go ahead. So. All right. So Caldwell, of course, is going to have uh, Cross Kelly, Zook, and Brooke get thrown into this uh, wheat field uh, whirlwind, if you will. Mm-hmm. Um, they, of course, are going to get chewed up. Um, and yeah, these are small brigades to begin yeah, with, re- right? Relatively small because the whole division, I think, only has like 3,300 men. Okay. Um, so, yeah, that's a lot. But don't forget, we got a lot of fighting going inside that very tight 25 acres here. Okay. Now, with that, what does that do? What does that do to the Cemetery Ridge line? Leaves a big empty spot, okay? And it's going to wind up getting even uh, more empty because as the uh, Confederate attacks uh, continue to press up, uh, going into the wheat field, uh, into the peach orchard, pushing uh, sickles off of the peach orchard, pushing sickles off of the Emmitsburg Road line. Eventually, the, the attacks are going to start to move into that area. And by this point, um, as the uh, Third Corps starts to retreat or fall back from the uh, Peach Orchard and Cemetery Ridge line. This is whenever Sickles is going to go down. Sickles, of course, gets hit. He's out of the action, probably for the better here. But um, George Meade at that point is going to order General Hancock to take over the um, Third Corps. 
which okay. is which is it's kind of like too little, too late. Which is, right, right, yeah, right. Too little, too late. And then Gibbon, of course, would be in charge of the second corps on the upper part of Cemetery Ridge. So, wait, so Hancock is taking over the third corps, or he's now moved to command of the center, which incorporates the third and the second corps. Yeah, he kind of does command. Even I think officially, Gibbon is given the uh, the command of the second corps because this happens several times. Um, as far as, you know, Hancock taking over other things, like whenever he leaves Tawny Town, Gibbons is put in charge mm. of the second corps. So this is kind of a common thing, if you will. Yeah. And uh, also, I would, also, I would notice that whenever, point this out too, as far as George Meade ignoring the seniority thing, because John Caldwell outranks John Gibbon. Okay. So, but who does Meade say to put in charge of the second corps? Gibbon. Gibbon. Okay. All right. Now, because Bernie's in, in command of the third corps, right? Yeah. After, Bernie, after Sickles goes down, Bernie's in command, and he is certainly not happy with this Hancock taking over the third corps thing. And he does have some comments about that later because he's, you know, complaining about the whole seniority thing, if you will. So, wait, wait, wait. Now I'm confused. So, so Bernie takes over the third corps. He's, yeah. He's, he's Sickles' division commander who. Uh, Ranks so, Humphreys because right. Humphreys only Humphreys the uh, Sickles second division is only a, as a brigadier general he's not a major general right so but then at some point Hancock takes over the third corps or takes over takes over the center wing if you will. I would say, effectively, he's in charge of the whole Cemetery Ridge line. Li- yeah. Okay, the whole line. Right. Um, and he's going to start piecing things back together. However, he's going to get some help. And this is something that I don't want to be left out of the um, out of the equation on, uh, I mean, I understand that, you know, Hancock is absolutely instrumental in saving that Cemetery Ridge line. Yeah. But he's going to get some help. And the one who's going to help him, I would say... Uh, The most when it comes to the artillery is going to be Freeman McGilvery. Now, Freeman McGilvery's artillery um, brigade, he's part of the uh, reserves there, uh, reserve artillery. That's the additional cannon that George Meade gives Dan Sickles to try to hold that line. Right. And McGilvery does. Um, They're able to hold off uh, Kershaw because Kershaw hits the uh, southern end of the Peach Orchard area first. But once Mississippi, Barksdale's Mississippians, they hit right on the corner, right on the apex of that um, salient, if you will. And that's when the line breaks. But Freeman McGilvery, as he starts pulling his cannons out of there, they're all going to stream past the Abraham Trossel farm. And as they do, this is whenever Freeman McGilvery is going to start setting up the famous Plum Run line. Because right by the uh, Trossel farm, you have the uh, Plum Run. And right about, I would say, probably 300 yards up from where Plum Run actually is, is where Freeman McGilvery is going to start grabbing every cannon. If your cannon is working order, you have ammunition, he starts to form a new cannon line right there on the end, just north of the Weikert Woods. Actually, even in front of the Weikert Woods, because Walcott's battery is going to be down there, as well as um, Melbourne Watson's Watson, battery. Yeah, 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 he's going to be in that same area. Now, where is that today on the battlefield? Where the uh, um, War Department placed uh, Melbourne Watson's guns? You know, there's a pair of guns that are kind of sit mm-hmm. in between Cemetery Ridge and the uh, Plum Run there. That's where the Plum Run line is. And if you, go, if you go out there, you can see that that is actually a very nice artillery platform. Yeah. And so Freeman McGilvery starts grabbing any gun. He didn't care if it was part of his thing or not. Again, one of those natural leaders. It's mm-hmm. the kind of thing that needs, you need to have happen in order to save a line or hold a line. Freeman McGilvery is one of those guys. I would say, and there's varying numbers here to how many cannon he did actually have. I'm going to say if you go all the way in front of the Weikert Woods, which is, um, uh, who is that? John Weikert, the son. The sun is down there by the northern slope of Little Round Top. So we got cannons there. That's Walcott. Then you have Melbourne Watson. Then you have various other batteries that you could put into that. And I would say at some point you probably have close 16, maybe even 20 guns, depending on how you count. So that starts forming a new line that the Confederates <clears throat> would have to break through before they actually get to Cemetery Ridge. Okay? Right, okay. However, you cannot just hold uh, a battle line with cannons alone. You no. need infantry. Right. And that's whenever we're going to get, of course, get the help from uh, George uh, Willard's New Yorkers. So that's later on. Though. That's as uh, uh, the cannon line's going to form, and then Willard's New Yorkers are going to be brought down. Right. Okay. So this is as the Confederate attack has worked its way up from the very south end, in front of the Round Tops. 
all right. the way up to the Peach Orchard going, and now uh, coming across the Emmitsburg Road. Yes, they're, right? and they're going through the Peach Orchard right now. Right. So they're yeah, they've so the Peach Orchard line has collapsed, the Emmitsburg Road line is in the process of collapsing. Yes. yes. And the Confederates are pushing them back and coming through and here's crazy Barksdale leading his brigade down and uh just uh is it is it just in the nick of time that Willard's brigade arrives or I would say I would say yes because this uh late afternoon and early evening on day 2 that that whole southern part of Cemetery Ridge is very dicey, very mm. scary. Mm. Yeah, so uh, let's just recap here. So Hancock's core is pulled into the action uh, down on the south end, caused by Sickles, yes. uh, moving out away yes. from his assigned position. And uh, at that point, it's just Caldwell's division. Yes. And yeah. then... Along with the Fifth Corps. Along with the Fifth Corps, right. Yeah. But I'm saying from Hancock's Corps. Uh, and so Caldwell's division goes down there, and then uh, the the battle progresses, moves its way north, and now he's got to put some infantry to support this line of artillery, yes. which basically is the only thing there, right? Yes. It's quite an empty spot. Look yes. at your Leno map. You want to talk about an empty spot? It's like, woo. Yeah, a big gap. <laughs> so now he's got to pull out of... Hayes' division, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's Willard's Brigade. Yeah. So they're up by the Bryan Farm. Yes. And he's going to wind up. Hancock actually brings them all the way down and places them uh, on the line there. Right. <coughs> Excuse me. So uh, Willard's got what? Uh, five regiments or four? Um, he's got four. Four. 126, 125th, 111, 39th, New York. All New go. Yorkers. About 1,500 men. All right, and so he's going to come down and uh, deploy his brigade, and they're going to face Barksdale down yes. in in what's uh, called the plum. What do they call it? The plum, plum. run thicket. Plum. Uh, well, it's really called the Kadori Trossel thicket. That's it. That, yes, but that's right in Plum Run, right around Plum Run. Yeah, uh, there's a marker there to Willard. Um, yes, and we were just that's, there. Yeah, that's fur- that's further up though. Yeah, because Willard doesn't get hit until he's going back to uh, Cemetery Ridge. Right. Now, his brigade uh, almost, ch- well, does push eventually Barksdale's brigade back oh, to yeah. the Emmitsburg Road, right? In part, uh, they're also going to go after part of um, uh, Wilcox's Alabamians. Uh, okay. Right, right. Yeah, one of the, um, and I, I don't I don't want to take anything away from them, but you know how people overplay the 20th Maine thing? Um, you, so it might be a little bit of overplaying with the uh, 1st Minnesota. Mm-hmm. I mean, 1st Minnesota doesn't stop. Wilcox's Alabamians all on their own. Right. Part of it is going to be George Willard's New Yorkers as Wilcox's, because um, Wilcox, so we got um, Barksdale's Mississippians, then right next to them we have Wilcox's Alabamians, and then we have Lang's Floridians. Mm-hmm. Okay, And then a little little bit later you're going to have Wright's Georgians who hit near the Copse of Trees, right. just south of the Copse. Now, I have to tell you that, um, you know, in all my years coming here and, and everything, I'm sure I read about Willard's Brigade in one of the, you know, general histories that I've read, but it never sunk in with me. I always thought that the 1st Minnesota was the only infantry unit in that section, mm. and they single handedly went out and scared Wilcox's 1,300 men. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And and so it wasn't until we started doing this show and we did an episode on Willard's Brigade mm-hmm. and I was doing the prep for it. And I'm like, wait a second. Willard's guys helped the first Minnesota. Oh, yeah. It wasn't just the first Minnesota. Yeah, no it was doubt. what was it? The 125th or 126th? Well, 125th and 126th are going to basically face off against Barksdale. The 111th is actually kind of gets almost on part of the flank of the uh, Wilcox's Alabamians. So the 111th is the one that's held on the reserve in, in reserve on the mm-hmm. right of the right rear of oh, that, uh, yes. Willard's Brigade yeah. and then the 39th is on the left yeah, in thir- reserve. Yeah, 39th is going to wind up going through the uh, <clears throat> Uh, Weikert Woods to recapture um, Watson. Watson's guns. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and and by the way, you mentioned Watson's guns today. They're misplaced. That monument yes. is misplaced. Yes. It should be on the other side of the road. Yes. yes. I I agree one hundred percent. But uh, and it's in, and this is what I love about the, the park roads and everything. The road that we call United States Avenue today that goes in front of the Trossel Farm mm-hmm. and everything like that. When it basically bends. At the Trossel Farm, or just after the Trossel yeah. Farmhouses, mm-hmm. 
It veers to the left, it, and it should go to the right. Right. The, the horse trail that's there apparently is, it, is the original farmland. Yeah, I believe that. Yeah, I do too. Yeah. And so, um, if you if you were to imagine that the road that there that's there at the modern day, when it gets to the point of that horse trail, everything that's paved wasn't there as a road. It was just a field. Exactly. And so, and and I think what was it that Watson? It was described that Watson's battery was north of the road. Yeah, something or there's like a 300 yard discrepancy or something yeah. like that. Yeah. And and when they placed it, they didn't realize that the road, road was wasn't there. wasn't there. So they're looking at the wrong <laughs> road. Yeah. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Okay. But which is which is cool. So that that horse trail is the actual farm lane that the farmers that the yes. Trossel farm and both Weikerts would have used to get to the Emmitsburg Road and probably to the Tony. Town yeah. Road, right? And I'm also, imagining. There are woods. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, so, um, yeah, so that was Willard's Brigade was was down there too, helping w- with the first. Actually, they were there fighting first, right? And the first Minnesota was then sent yes. in. Yeah. Yes. So, mm-hmm. so they were doing the fight, but they get no credit until addressing right. Gettysburg came along. No one ever heard of Willard's Brigade. That. I just want, <laughs> I just wanted to, everybody to know that. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, Continue. Okay, so we have um, so Willard, of course, is engaged, and they're going to wind up um, stopping. First of all, they wind up shooting. I give them the credit for shooting Barksdale off his horse. Okay. Once Barksdale goes down, um, that Mississippi uh, brigade is going to falter, and then it's going to start to fall back. Okay. They don't really don't get much further. Maybe they did get slightly cross uh, Plum Run, but somewhere around there, they're going to start falling back. Mm. Now, remember our whole progressive attack. Uh, that some people don't like to use the word in echelon. Effectively, that's kind of what happens one after the other. I'm not going to use the word. I just put that out there. You're allowed to here. I okay. don't have a problem with it. And then, so here comes Wilcox's Alabamians. Now, Wilcox's <coughs> Alabamians, that's a 1,700-man brigade. However, there is one regiment. Um who kind of isn't part of the battle line, and that's the 8th Alabama, which is well over 400 men. Mm. So the ones who actually go into the uh, Kadori Trossel thicket, if you will, is going to be closer to 1,200 men. Okay. So number one, they're short some 400-plus who aren't even up to where the rest of that Alabama brigade are. Huh. And they're going to be held back by the uh, right of Willard's men, who are, of course, firing into that Alabama brigade. And then Hancock is progressing up. So Hancock, as he moves here... On the Cemetery Ridge Line, he's going to be all the way down there, just north of the um, where the uh, just north of the George Weikert Farm on Cemetery Ridge. He's going to wind up moving up. He places Willard. Willard stops Barksdale. Moving further up, uh, they're going to start, of course, encountering the large Alabama Brigade. Still, 1,200 men coming towards you. Uh, with a big open space and not a lot of guys is a little bit daunting. Yeah. And then Hancock's going to arrive up and he's going to run into William Coville, who's in charge of the, of course, 1st Minnesota. Wants to know what regiment it is. The reason why that regiment is there is because anytime you have artillery in position, you should always have some infantry protecting it. And the 1st Minnesota was there to uh, protect, if you will, uh, Evan Thomas's uh, six Napoleons who were just slightly to the right of that. So we got Evan Thomas who's firing with six Napoleons, I would give them the credit for holding. Now, whenever you think of a brigade line coming towards you, okay, so I have, just you're just facing me, I have Alabama coming towards me. On, on Alabama's right, held up by Willard, the center part is what gets blunted by the first Minnesota. Okay. okay? Right-hand side, or their left-hand their side, left. my right, is going to be held up by Evans' Napoleons. Uh-huh. Okay? All right, so that's what's up on that end. So the, uh, is where's their monument? Is that in front of the PA monument? Evans' Napoleons? Yeah. I'm not sure. It's got to be somewhere in there. But it's that's yeah. the area we're talking yeah. about. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, so that's, and whenever Hancock sees that, of course, the, uh, the cannons are already firing into the uh, left of... Um, Wilcox is Alabamians, but that center part there is empty. Mm. And this is where that famous charge of the first Minnesota comes in. And again, I'm not taking anything away from them. I'm just saying, yeah, they had a pretty big part to play here. But, you know, 262 men with 215 killed and wounded in, what, 10, 15 minutes is Mm. absolutely devastating. But this is what they do whenever they go down into that... um, Plum Run there, that Plum Run thicket area there, they really stagger that Alabama brigade. And then you can't forget to add the whole 
confusion, if you will, confusion of battle and then the smoke of battle. Yeah. Okay, this has already been going on. We've got the cannon fire. you got those sultry summer days. you got all this smoke that's hanging around. So quite often, you don't really know what may or may not be behind that to the left of it, to the right to the right of it. Mm-hmm. But the bottom line is, it really stops Wilcox's Alabamians. Sure. Okay? Between those three things, Willard, First Minnesota, Evans Guns, they're going to stop the Wilcox's Alabamians in that thicket area. Yeah, it's, it's just so astounding to me that there was a the whole team effort there. It wasn't yes. just the first Minnesota. Yes, and this is all largely <clears throat> directed, of course, by who? General Hancock. Right. You know, Old Winnie Boy. Old Winnie Boy. Now, so, and that's the thing, and it's nothing against Minnesota. I mean, I know no, this is their claim to fame not that they have one regiment here and they, you know, yeah. took 82% casualties and right. they single handedly saved. The line, but it wasn't as single-handedly as we'd like to think. No, no, you need some help. Yeah, and and they had it, but just as important as everybody else on that line, you know. But and and, but I mean, it is it is also, uh, you know, you think about it. It's they're going directly at the rocks. They they go right into the center of it. Right. Talk about having some cojones, man. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> the 111th, is that who it was? From, yeah, 111th from Willard. They're coming in sort of on the flank. Yeah, kind of like it, uh, enfilading a little bit onto the side. Yeah, yeah. which, you know, it's good. It's good. You you're need that. a lot of stuff. Sure. <laughs> but, I mean, the the wall, the brick wall that Wilcox's 1,200 or so are going to hit is it's the first, first Minnesota. Minnesota. So there you go, Minnesota. Okay, yeah. you're the brick wall. <laughs> um, oh, we got two listeners in Minnesota. They're not going to get that pissed. Uh, okay, so, uh, and then that's good. I didn't know about uh, Evan's battery either. Uh, maybe I did. I just forgot. Um, okay, so Hancock, though, wh- where is he when all this is going Whenever, on? He, okay, he's the one, of course, orders... Uh, the first Minnesota in. He could see the Alabamians coming. They're coming towards Plum Run. He orders them in, of course, to capture the colors. Right. That's that whole uh, scenario. So he's right there, which is going to be, um, by the way, first Minnesota. I say that where their monument is should be further to the north. Okay. Um, oh. I, don't, I don't think it's where it, it is because if you look at everything the way everything's spaced out, I would say probably more in front of where the PA monument is. Okay, is where the first Minnesota so should be. Just slightly, slightly north. Yeah. yeah. Now oh, they're part of. Uh, wait, don't tell me. Uh, shoot, I can't remember. First his Minnesota. Name. Yeah, yeah. God, I can't remember his name now. It's uh, it, uh, it's the uh, that's that backwards uh, brigade marker. Harrow? Are they Harrow. in Harrow's brigade or yeah. Hall's brigade? I think they're uh, Harrow. Harrow. Yeah. Okay. Well, it, the brigade marker is that brigade marker is right by there. Mo- their second monument, or I don't know which order it came in. The, you know how they have the oh, they, obelisk? They were put up at the same time, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, okay. One second day position, one third day position. Yes. Um, so their third day position, I guess this would be. Which is on the regular line part where the fence is. That's right. You, yeah. Yeah. It's right along the wall there, and right just south of the cops. than the other one. <laughs> much smaller. <laughs> Um, and then they have the, the the their other one is over in the cemetery in the Minnesota plot. Yeah, the the urn. Yeah. Yes, yeah, eighteen sixty seven. Yeah. Um, okay, so what was my point? Why did I bring that up about the monuments and the? Oh, oh, I just wanted to see if I could remember what brigade he was in. That's okay. All. Okay, yeah, that's sorry. Okay. Oh, good. <laughs> all right. So yeah. So Hancock though. So he's the guy who he's orders all, all this he, stuff. He's he, right in that midst of that action, and that's one of the things. Okay. About, you know, the com- that commanding presence th- that he absolutely has, and everybody respects him. And like they said, like I said early on here, you know, th- whenever his men see him, they feel confident and they are feel safe whenever he is there, of course, directing things. Yeah, so he's probably in the field behind Father Corby or something like that with this I statue. Would say he's everywhere. Oh, so he's flitting around. Yeah, yeah, he's <laughs> everywhere. Like a little butterfly. Like, well, directing. And he's one of those guys who has that um, commanding presence, but he's also very quick to see a situation and do something about it, you know? Yeah. He doesn't have that pensive attitude or or worry about is this the right command protocol or any of that crap, you know? He just does it. so So the story of the first Minnesota that I always, you always hear is, you know, the guides, when you hear it on a tour... You know, they don't go through the whole rigmarole yeah, like we you just time, went through, right? You don't have time, right? for, don't have time that. for that, right? So you go, you know, Hancock comes over, he sees the first Minnesota sitting here, and he comes over to him and he says, you know, what regiment is, what is this? there? Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, currently, see those colors, take them. And, you know, Colville goes and does it and all that. 
wh- where were they? Exa- were they down by the PA monument, maybe by the bathrooms or something? Like where were I they? Say, I would say, yeah. So they were all by themselves. Say, yes, they were by they were by themselves. Why were they not with the rest of the brigade? I don't know that. Hmm. Yeah. That's the question for the ages. Yeah. I don't. <laughs> well, they're not that far away, though. No, but I mean, I mean, uh, well, I don't oh, know where they, the brigade because, is because. Because think about this. Whenever, and this is one of the things that's kind of frustrating on on the battlefield. Whenever we see all these different artillery positions, yes, they're not necessarily where they were in the battle. You always Correct. need that field of fire. Yes. So if you have set like and this is especially true on West Confederate, where they got them all down by the road there. Mm-hmm. Okay? But if you look further out, you know sometimes it's fifty yards, sometimes it might be one hundred and fifty yards. You see a plateau. Well, that plateau looks like a nice artillery platform. Guess what? That's where those cannons right. were. Right. Okay? Right. Right. So the same thing's going to hold true on the uh, Union side. And as far as the, the guns, likely would have been somewhere around where we call Kadori Knoll or Hancock's uh, Wounding Knoll, whatever you want to call it, mm-hmm. in right around that area there. Okay. So, I'm um, see, I'm just, I'm looking through the uh, Lena book to answer my own question, but go ahead, continue the, the narrative, <laughs> if you will. Okay, so the next next brigade in line making this uh, uh, progressive attack is going to be Lang's Floridians. Now, the Floridians are going to be on the um, left of Wilcox's Alabamians as they're coming towards the Union line. However, it's going to wind up being a, a rather small brigade, and uh, just over um, 700 men, probably around 750-ish. And they're going to be wind up getting hit by another artillery battery, which is going to be uh, Weir's guns, uh, Weir's guns. And then you're going to have some Union units who would have been up by the Emmitsburg Road who wind up getting driven back by um, Lang's Floridians and then Wright's Georgians. There is another brigade that is, is on the uh, left of the Floridians, and that's going to be Ambrose Rand's right. And Rand's right is going to be the only one, as far as Confederate brigades go, that actually get the credit for making it to the Cemetery Ridge line. Mm-hmm. And this is another thing I, I try to emphasize. Even though with the mess that Sickles creates in the Peach Orchard and how Hancock's Second Corps, you get stripped of so many different troops and you got this big empty spot on the bottom part of Cemetery Ridge. The only Confederate brigade that actually makes it to the Cemetery Ridge proper here on the early evening of day two is going to be Wright's Georgians. Now, they can't break through. They can't stay there, but they made it there. And that's one of those things that's going to be um, encouraging or inspiring to General Lee whenever he decides to make the attacks go in into the third day, it's going to be because of all the partial successes. And General Lee considers Wright making it to that Union line, Cemetery Ridge, just south of the Copse of Trees. Um, Lee believes that part of the Union line is weak. But really, what was it? It was essentially stripped of a lot of Union soldiers. Mm. Because I think whenever Hancock started a day here on day two, he's going to have more than 40 regiments. Going from the uh, Cemetery Hill, which turns into Cemetery Ridge, all the way down to just north of the uh, George Weikert farm, 40-some regiments in that area. And then by the time uh, Wright's Georgians make their attack, you probably don't even have 20 along that part of the line. Yeah, doesn't look so it's like gonna it. Get, it's going to get a lot thinner. And so that may be one of the reasons that uh, the Georgians did make it. And he and there's no, you know, this isn't day three. The whole army's not up yet. Mm-hmm. So there's nobody, according to the map I'm looking at, nobody in reserve no. behind him. No, there's not. And what winds up happening, by the way, let me let me go back to our first Minnesota. Um, first Minnesota, Thomas's guns, and of course Willard's men holding back those uh, Confederate brigades. There, one of the things that it's going to allow the remnants of the Third Corps to do, especially under Andrew Humphreys, okay? Humphreys is kind of one of those uh, better leaders there at this point in time. Mm -hmm. He's putting his line of the Third Corps back together as best he can. So as more time passes, yes, they fall through. They fall through McGilvery's line. They fall through what's uh, Willard. They're going to fall through past Minnesota and all that sort of stuff. But as they start to reform, Humphreys is going to bring them back up. So that's that whole idea of buying time. So you're going to use lives to buy time so that you can put this line back together. And I don't want to discount Humphreys uh, as not getting credit for 
making some of that line more secure. Right. That was just a big empty spot before. So without reading uh, everything, because then I can't pay attention to what you're saying, so I can't do that. So I'm just kind of looking at the maps, trying to see what's going on here. And what, what I didn't realize until I looked at these maps now okay. is that Wilcox, I, I always pictured him coming straight across the Emmitsburg Road from, say, the first Minnesota monument, okay? Yeah. Like, if you stand at that monument and you look straight out, yeah. I imagine that's where Wilcox yeah, it's, it's is coming from. A, it's kind of a... He's coming at an yeah. oblique angle, because mm-hmm. um, he first has to finish off Humphrey's division. Yeah, you got to push through Humphrey's, yeah. and Humphrey's by no means was a pushover. No. Okay. And so, uh, and that's the thing, is Wilcox, I, I, I never really thought about this or uh, you know but, what so he has even less men yeah, exactly go, I forgot about yeah. that so he's he's I always thought he was a fresh brigade mm-hmm. But no, no, he, he had, had a, just done some fighting, and now they're continuing along, and they're they they kind of it looks like you know they're coming straight across the Emmitsburg Road, hitting Humphreys, and then maybe they're just following Humphreys. Divisions essentially, retreat essentially, right? Yes, yes. And so that makes them now go uh, just for simplicity's sake straight east to northeast, mm-hmm. and that's okay. the, the route changes there. And um, there's the first Minnesota, yeah, just kind of sitting there. Yeah. And the, okay, but I can see that. And Willard, by the way, again. In my head, I'm picturing these guys all close together. Willard and then the first there's, Minnesota's directly to his right. Yeah. But there's a huge there's gap. Gaps. Yeah. And so the 111th New York is kind of going to go up to their northwest-ish to meet. At an angle. Yeah, yeah. going at an angle. I'm just trying to put a picture, uh, paint a picture in people's heads here. Um, to go up and hit Wil- Wilcox in the flank. Mm-hmm. While the poor little first Minnesota goes right <laughs> out smack the, in the middle, smack in the middle. But you got Thomas's battery there, mm-hmm. and the 19th Maine is just slightly north of Thomas's yeah, battery. And, and the 19th Maine is going to wind up getting sent out by Hancock to uh, recapture Weir's guns, right? Because okay. Weir's guns are going to wind up getting run over. Yeah, and um, uh, 19th Maine Colonel uh, Heath, I believe, goes out to get them back. And then, uh, yeah, then it's just a big mess. And then there, okay, so there's the first Minnesota going in, and you're, yeah, they're hitting like the two center regiments of Wilcox's brigade, and the 111th is coming up and hitting the right flank. But, and then there's a, so like the first Minnesota and the 111th have a good gap between them. Mm-hmm. And uh, the 111th to their left is this wide open gap between their main brigade. Yeah, but by that and time, then, uh, Mississippi already started back off. But they're going back. Yeah, but I'm just, you know, pointing this out here. And then, uh, but now you've got some reinforcements that are making their way from the 12th Corps over here. Lockwood's brigade, yeah, apparently. Lockwood. Really, it's only going to be Lockwood. Yeah. A lot of the other guys get lost. <laughs> <laughs> right. All right. So so Hancock, he's he's flitting about everywhere, you know, getting into whatever he needs to get into. Mm-hmm. A real leader, a real commander. And um, the fighting comes to a close, let's say, or unless you want to, well, unless there's something else you want to get let's, to. Let's talk about the, let's go to um, once the uh, Georgians. Wright's Georgians come and hit the line. They are um, going to be kind of uh, in a box, if you will, and they, or put into a box. The reason why, much the same thing happens to uh, Pickett on a larger scale the next day. But essentially, we're going to have the uh, Vermonters who are going to wind up going out. And then on the other side, you're going to have some of the other Union men who wind up going out. So without any support, Posey's Mississippians who were supposed to come in after Wright's men, remember our progressive attacker, one after the other, um, were supposed to be uh, Posey's Mississippians. They all got hung up around the uh, Bliss Farm, which is another story in itself mm-hmm. that we had gone over um, before. So mm-hmm. that takes the steam. And Willard, not Willard, Wright's Georgians are the only ones who are going to finish uh, attacking that part of Cemetery Ridge. Once Wright is stopped, uh, Vermont is going to come out, fire into the flank. Wright has, by the way, uh, Ambrose Wright's Georgians, they're going to have nearly 50% casualties just getting to the line and then getting back. And of course, Wright's Georgians don't play a part on day three, but they did make it over there. Now, once that settles down, Wright's Georgians are driven back. 
Next thing that's going to wind up happening here is we're going to be getting near dark, near around the 8 o'clock time frame. And this is whenever Hancock is sees that the Cemetery Ridge line has stabilized. Of course, we got Lockwood's Brigade. we got Humphreys, pieces of Humphreys' division getting back together. And he's going to notice that on the right-hand side, uh, he's going to start hearing firing, the roar of battle, battle, if you will, on the other side of Cemetery Hill. Okay, he knows Howard's over there. Remember, Hancock was here yesterday on day one. He already saw that area, and he figures, okay, now the Confederates are attacking over there. I'm going to send some help over, and he's going to tell Gibbon to send Carroll over, mm, Samuel okay. Carroll. And once Carroll gets over there, by that time, Louisiana— Probably some parts of Avery's North Carolinians got all among the Union cannoneers, got the hand-to-hand fighting as it's getting dark. Carroll's men are going to assist in driving them back down the hill. And that's whenever the fighting finally ends here on day two. So Hancock at that point, is he's just sending help. Is he over there? Does he go to Cemetery Hill no, at any point? No, he does not go over there. Because right, that's he not sent, his jurisdiction. Right. He sends help over there. Plus, he's still concerned about his uh, Cemetery Ridge line as well, you know, because sure. he wants to make sure— that this line is going to be solid. Right. Okay. So he's basically taking care of it for whatever yeah. comes tomorrow. Yes, which is going to be a whole nother day. <laughs> and, but he doesn't know that. <laughs> oh, no. No. Yeah. And maybe we'll have you back on to talk about him on J- uh, July 3rd. Okay. Because we'll, we, we should. Not maybe. We'll do yeah. that. Yeah. Okay. We'll, we'll do that. That'll be fun. Uh, all right. You glean so, anything else from that? Uh, yeah, that I need to study more. <laughs> I, for some reason, my uh, I, I stop at Wilcox being pushed back. I, I don't, okay. and then it just jumps up to Wright, and you know, and then but the, yeah, there's there's Lang, and and then there's Wright, and there's a lot more to pay attention to. But you know, I you know I, I yeah, and you got to give also you got to give the. Uh, um the Vermonters credit. This is one of those things where, again, Hancock is right there. He's the oh, one yeah. who orders Randall in 13th Vermont, you know, to do this. So, right there, it's just funny. I just happened to open to that page when you said that. Oh, okay. for, right there, 13th and 14th and 16th Vermont. Uh, yeah, right, because they're going up against Wright's right flank, mm-hmm. and then you got Hall's brigade. Uh, Going up, uh, looks like the bulk of them, and then it uh, looks like, uh, what is that, Webb throws out the 106 PA yeah. to flank them there. And, yeah, they're on, everybody yeah. has a good time. Ver- Vermont's, ver- that's that box, does it look like, a, it should be a box, does it look like a box? Does what look like I a box? I can't see what Matt's looking at. What does what look like a box? What Where right goes into the cemetery ridge line. Right. You're going to have uh, the Vermonters on one side, and then you have, who is that? Web, part of Webb goes out. They go out. 106 PA. Yeah. They yeah. Go, but they go out the other side of the wall. Correct. They, yes. yes. They go over the wall, and then they uh, come in on uh, Wright's left flank. Yeah. Can you imagine being in that? No. Yeah. No, I can't imagine being in any of this. <laughs> I mean, I, that, that's why I do this show. I'm trying to get an idea without ever having to go through it. Uh, I mean, obviously, I'll never be able to go through this because it's over. But all right. So what we'll do then uh, is we'll take a break. We'll come back. We have questions from our patrons. Of course, ladies and gentlemen, you must know this by now that if you want to send questions in for an Ask a Guide, you need to be a patron. Um, And uh, any level patron gets to ask a question. doesn't matter what level you're at. But of course, the value is at the second lieutenant level. Uh, that's where you get every episode that we put in, uh, or put out, excuse me, for the uh, for the month. And uh, so go ahead over to patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg. Create your own account if you don't have one already and become a patron. You will not be disappointed. There's literally hundreds of episodes over there. We put out four episodes a month, Mike, on Patreon. Only two episodes on the free feed. Mm. So that's where the money's at. Got it. Literally do. where the money's at. All right. So that's it. We'll, we'll take a break. We'll be right back after these words. Movies and documentaries about history are spread out across the internet, and their quality is often suspect. History Fix delivers curated historic programming to your preferred device using their website or branded apps. Join History Fix for movies, documentaries, short films, and how-tos. Content covers historic eras ranging from the 1st to the 21st centuries. Their team of curators brings you the most comprehensive and authentic historical content available. Addressing Gettysburg podcast fans receive 20% off their first annual subscription. Subscription. So what are you waiting for? Sign up at www.historyfix.com and use promo code ADGBURG. That's A-D-G-B-U-R-G. Every subscription begins with a seven-day risk-free trial. And after signing up, 
Download the History Fix app on your smartphone. So go to www.historyfix.com and use promo code ADGBURG, that's A-D-G-B-U-R-G, on an annual subscription. Escape into history with History Fix. If you're a lover of history, then go to trhistorical.com. There, you'll find apparel, drinkwear, decor, and more featuring a wide range of subjects from the ancient world to the Cold War. Looking to make an impression with the perfect gift? Well, TR Historical now offers a vintage wrapping service for a truly unique presentation. And our listeners will save 15% when using promo code GBERG1863 at checkout. So go to trhistorical.com. TR Historical, for the love of history. Who can forget the sounds of the 60s? The 1860s. I can't, and you can't either. Now, there's Marching Through Georgia, the exciting new album by Billy Webster. All of your favorite hits of the 1860s in one place. Such hits as Gary Owens. The Battle Hymn of the Republic. Quiet along the Potomac tonight. Marching through Georgia. And much, much more. So what are you waiting for? Go to billysongs.com and order your digital download of Billy Webster's Marching Through Georgia today. That's billysongs.com. For the Historian has a wide variety of titles, new and used, of military books from publishers like Osprey, Gettysburg Publishing, Stackpole, Savas Beattie, UNC Press, and more. I make it a point to go there once a week because I have new bookshelves to fill and I never know what treasures I'll find, and neither will you. They even have toy soldiers, model kits, games, children's books, and more. So stop by and check them out on your next visit to Gettysburg, or better yet, order right now online at ForTheHistorian.com and mention that you heard about them on Addressing Gettysburg in the Note to Seller box, and they will refund you your shipping. And if you call 717-685-5207 or stop by the store on your next visit and mention us, you'll get 20% off retail price. That's ForTheHistorian.com or 717-685-5207. Seminary Ridge Museum and Education Center, Gettysburg's premier museum, is housed in the historic Lutheran Seminary building constructed in 1832, a witness to the first day of battle. The museum's three floors of exhibits connect visitors to the dilemmas that led to the Civil War, provide a powerful and personal view of the battle's first day, and explore one of the battlefield's largest hospitals. No visit to Seminary Ridge Museum and Education Center is complete without a guided tour of the building's famous cupola, where on the eve of battle, officers and civilians saw thousands of Confederate soldiers' campfires burning to the west, and Brigadier General John Buford watched for vital federal reinforcements as fighting erupted on the morning of July 1st. Today, you can stand where Buford stood and discover how this view helped chart the course of the Battle of Gettysburg. Your trip to Gettysburg is not complete without a serious visit to Seminary Ridge Museum and Education Center, Gettysburg's premier museum. Purchase tickets online at seminaryridgemuseum.org or call 717-339-1300. To get tickets or a cupola tour, listeners may call or walk in and mention address in Gettysburg or by ordering online using the promo code AG1863 for 20% off. Seminary Ridge Museum and Education Center. It began here. There's a devil to pay. Attention all aficionados of Union Civil War music, your ensemble awaits. The National Association of Civil War Musicians, founded by the Grand Army of the Republic, serves as a beacon for those who cherish the notes that stirred a nation. Our association is a hub where the scores of the past are preserved and the spirit of camaraderie persists. Immerse yourself in the melodies that played through history. For example, take July 3rd, 1863. As Lee's cannons unleashed a maelstrom, the Philadelphia Brigade Band exemplified valor. Positioned at the heart of the onslaught, their music defied the cacophony of the largest artillery barrage in North American history. Their presence was a deliberate symbol. If the band could stand tall and play, then the infantrymen can lay in wait to hold that crucial ground. Today, we keep this and other memories alive. 
No matter if you sound the fife, beat the drum, or swell the brass, your contribution breathes life into our mission. Let's commemorate, collaborate, and preserve together. Step forward and join the ranks today. Visit NACWM.org. That's NACWM.org, the National Association of Civil War Musicians, honoring all the brave soldiers who dared to wage a war with only an instrument. Civil War Trails is the world's largest open-air museum offering over 1,500 sites and stories for you to explore. Each Civil War Trails site has an interpretive sign to help fuel your imagination as you stand on remote mountaintop artillery positions, in fields where thundering cavalry charges took place, or in now quiet downtowns where raids, riots, or raiders shattered the peace. Over 60 Civil War Trail sites allow you to stand in the footsteps of the Gettysburg Campaign across Virginia, West Virginia, Maryland, and of course, Pennsylvania. In fact, they are expanding further into Pennsylvania now with the latest sites in Wrightsville, Hanover, and Chambersburg. As you travel the trail, you'll find more than just great history. Beyond battlefields, great barbecue, beer, and bourbon await. Here's a pro tip. Carry cash and never book your day completely to ensure that you can take that gravel road, explore that hiking trail, or pick up an amazing artifact from that awesome antique shop you find along the way. Request a free brochure shipped right to your door at civilwartrails.org and be sure to snap a hashtag sign selfie next time you are out exploring. Click the link to Civil War Trails in our show notes. Follow Civil War Trails and create some history of your own. You're listening to the Addressing Gettysburg podcast with Matt Callery. And we are back, ladies and gentlemen, with Mike Rupert uh, and your questions. And again, these questions are submitted by some of our awesome patrons over at patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg. So why don't you make yourself awesome and become a patron as well? Tell you what, I'll stop reminding you to become a patron if we if we hit 600 by the end of 2023. We we just hit 400. So if we can get 200 more in the latter half of the year, which by the way it never goes at that rate, but maybe some of you will. Uh, whatever, it doesn't matter. Here we go. Brian Derenick has our, our first question. He says, "What prior relationship or experience did Meade have with Hancock that gave me the confidence to rely on him so heavily at Gettysburg? Did Meade not have a, sim- a similar confidence in any of his other corps commanders?" We kind of touched on this before. Yeah, a little bit here. Uh, as far as that goes, the relationship that uh, General Hancock and General Meade are going to have actually goes back uh, to their battlefield experience. They've worked together um, in the Army, the Potomac. They both knew of each other. Um, Sometimes they coordinated different actions and that sort of thing. So by the time we get to here, now remember, Gettysburg is mid-war. So we already had two and a half years of war. Mm. And these are both seasoned commanders. Again, I said this earlier, once you get to this point, you got people who you trust and people who you don't trust. Right. You've had enough time to get to know everybody. Exactly. It's a whole thing about getting to know mm-hmm. and one of the things um that's going to happen just a, a quick um meeting kind of thing if you will as soon as uh, on the 28th whenever george meade is given command of the army generals hancock and generals gibbon are going to go to congratulate him mm. okay now if you're going to do something like that it's not going to be somebody who you don't already have a, of course a very good previous relationship with sure uh, Philip May, I'm sorry, Richie Austin. We'll oh, get wait, to wait, fi- wait, oh, wait. Oh, 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 skip what, a couple what, of things here. What did I skip? S- similar confidence in other core commanders. Oh yeah. You want to run down the list? <laughs> Let's do it. Okay, Reynolds. Uh, Meade did have a, an incredible relationship sure. with Reynolds. That's why Reynolds was in put, in, put in charge of the whole left wing, first, eleventh, and um, third corps. So, and course, didn't Reynolds go to Meade when he uh, heard that he, t- he was in, placed in command and said, "I got your back," basically? Yeah. It, it's Essentially that, um, Reynolds, um, and there are going to be numerous uh, uh, commanders who, after Chancellorsville, who say, you know, Meade's the good guy. You know, that's who you want, you know, to run yeah, yeah. this army. Um, so he's going to have um, already, again, you got that experience. you got those relationships that start to get built. And as these things get built, that's what you work from. But Reynolds, of course, day one, he's gone. All right. What about Second Corps? Hancock, of course, we talked about Hancock, the excellent relationship that him and uh, General uh, Meade have with each other. Third Corps? Sickles. Uh, no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> now, Fifth Corps, uh, George Sykes. George Sykes is uh, kind of a, one of those unusual guys. He does get sent off to the West um, a little bit after this. Um, gets involved with um, on the uh, the Sioux Indian War or something like that. Um, he is 
He's an okay commander, but he's not an inspiring commander, if you will. Yeah. Okay. We don't really talk a lot yeah, about no, yeah, Sykes. He's, he's like left out. Also notice he has no equestrian hair. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. No equestrian hair. Why is that? Well, because he just was not that kind of a leader, you know? They didn't ride a horse, in other words. <laughs> no. He's just kind of humdrum. <laughs> just, yeah, yeah, okay. Boring old Sykes. Okay. Now, six core, Uncle John. Everybody loved Uncle John, um, but... Uh, John Sedgwick is going to be more of a, um, he's not, he's not that kind of inspiring, uh, go get him leader like Hancock is like that. And another thing I, I would say this, I noticed, I saw on your screen thing there that John Wayne is one of your idols. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well. Winfield Scott Hancock is John, John Wayne. Wayne. Oh, oh, he was John Wayne. <laughs> <laughs> no, that is that personality is Winfield Scott Hancock. Yeah, okay. yeah. No nonsense. Let's get the job done. Okay. All right. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I see you, that. You can add that similarity between those. Well, two. now I'm going to have to t- b- split screen it and have a picture of both of them next to each other on my screen. Okay, keep us keep going yep. down here. Howard, Howard. no, because mm-hmm. when uh, Hancock gets sent up here, he said he supersedes Howard. Okay, mm-hmm. so Meade does not have the confidence in Howard. Um, Slocum, Slocum as the because uh, Meade. Wait, sorry, uh, Meade could have easily or just as easily summoned Howard to come back and report to him in Tawny Town, couldn't he? No, not when you're engaged. He's got he's got. Well, to, you know, it's like hey, when you guys turn in for the night, you come back. <laughs> No, 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 no. no. Oh, okay, no. so so send so he couldn't have sent, or shouldn't. Well, have. he he could have just sent. You know, I'm sorry, not sent. He shouldn't have summoned. No, he should right. not have. And so that was right. Yeah. Okay. He was right there. But whoever he did send up here, he said, you know, with Hancock, he says, you're in command of everything. Okay. You decide, is this a good place to fight or should we, you know, choose another place to fight? So uh, Meade does not have the um, confidence, of course, in Howard Slocum. Even though Slocum is a senior, Slocum, again, is not one of those inspiring guys. And by the way, 11th and 12th Corps, they wind up going, serving out in uh, Sherman's Army in the yeah. Western Theater. So yeah. they're going to kind of get, whenever the uh, armies are reorganized, they wind up leaving anyways. They get consolidated, don't yeah, they? Yeah, they did in the 20th Corps. Yeah. Is that enough? Yeah, I think You want to so. talk about Pleasanton? Pleasanton. And Hunt? And you want to you go all the way? All the way down there. Yeah, I mean... No. No? Okay. All right. <laughs> We're just talking infantry then. All right. Uh, Richie Austin says, What happened between Hancock and Howard on the afternoon of the 1st when Hancock assumed command by way of General Meade? Was it dramatic? Was it a non-event? Are we not supposed to know and let the suspense last? I've heard all kinds of salacious rumors and would love to get a, uh, get closer to the truth. So let's, yeah, all right, let's get into that. So okay. you said you were going to get yeah, into that. I, I do. I do have a quote here, I think, that's going to kind of... Uh, bring some of this out. Um, it's a little bit of a lengthy quote. I know you don't want to read and stuff, but in no, order to get ahead. the gist of it, I can't memorize all this crap. Okay, Nobody can. <laughs> but by all means, read. I never feel uh, that you let me read. Let me give you some background here. Mm. Background is this. Um, remember that during the first day of battle, uh, some misinformation is going to wind up getting back to George Meade uh, from Howard. The double day's line gave way. Okay. And Meade is going to take that at face value, if you will, remove Doubleday from command, and then it's going to put a six core division commander in charge of the first corps at the end of the first day. Okay, that's going to be John Newton. And uh, Doubleday is going to, of course, have problems with this. So then Doubleday winds up leaving field command after Gettysburg. He works, I think, in the judge advocate office in uh, Washington, D.C., um, for the rest of the war and such. But nonetheless, all these uh, generals and all these participants are going to be writing in all the publications that all the, uh, of course, that are out there, Tribune, uh, sometimes they have their own memoirs, all their own books, Philadelphia Weekly Times, on and on, all these different publications. The uh, veterans become this uh, writing and political powerhouse in the latter part of the 19th century. Mm-hmm. Okay, so we got all these writings going on. Now, also, we got a lot of uh, trying to get you back, right? If you want, right? Okay? Let's see if I can, you know, <laughs> stick this knife in you and maybe turn it. <laughs> Vendettas. And 
Now, listen, I do I do like Double Day. Double Day did an excellent job here on day one. Yeah. Um, he, again, he does he does not get the credit for that. No. However, Double Day is going to be an instigator here in this uh, Hancock um, Hancock Howard controversy when Hancock arrives on the field towards the end of day one there on Cemetery Hill. And this is going to come to this is going to be uh, one of the staff officers on Double Day. Okay. Another thing I need to point out here is that uh, staff officers will lie for their commander. Oh sure. Okay. Oh yeah. Of <laughs> that loyalty. And this is uh, this is going to be uh, uh, Captain uh, Hellstead's account here. Again, Double Day staff. He writes. I return. This is I, Halstead, returned to where General Howard sat, just as General Hancock approached at a swinging gallop. When when he neared General Howard, who was then alone, he saluted and with great animation, as if there was no time for ceremony, said that General Meade had sent him forward to take command of the three corps. General Howard replied that he was senior. General Hancock said, I am aware of that, General, but I have written orders in my pocket from General Meade, which I will show you if you wish to see them. General Howard said, no, I don't doubt your word. General Hancock, and this is uh, in italics here, but you can give no orders here while I am here. Oh. Mm, Remember who's writing this. Okay. Hancock replied, very well, General Howard. I will second any order that you have to give, but General Meade has also directed me to select the field on which to fight this battle in rear of Pipe Creek. And then casting one glance from Culp's Hill to the Round Top, he continued, but I think this is a strong position by nature in which to fight a battle that I have ever saw, and if it meets with your approbation, I will select this as a battlefield. General Howard responded, I think it a very strong position. Very well, sir. I select this as a battlefield. Hmm. And that was from one of Howard's staff? Yeah. No, this is from, from Doubleday Double Day staff. Okay. okay. Remember, so, yeah. Doubleday Double Day has a thing, uh, I should say, a, uh, a problem with George Meade mm-hmm. for removing him from command here. Mm-hmm. And so this is Double Day's uh, way, if you will, to throw, you know, a wrench into the works here. So in other words, he's saying that uh, uh, Meade's proxy, Hancock, Mm -hmm. was basically tits on a bull. Yes. And, 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 yeah, okay. So, but really, okay. okay. You you got some things here. But you think you're hitting Meade, but you're also hitting Hancock there. Yes, yes, which kind of doesn't make any sense, but apparently Double Day doesn't really care about that. And um, or again, he, he's he of course is after Meade. Meade Meade is clearly the the target here, and because he is Meade's representative, like you said, mm. that's who we're going to go after. <laughs> now you know the personality. Think about the per- okay. Let's use John Wayne. Yeah. Do you think John Wayne would respond to Howard like this? No. Oh, no. <clears throat> no. No. Okay. He'd be like, uh, you know, I'd be goddamned if yeah. I'm going to take orders from you <laughs> or do anything. I have orders from the commanding general. That's it. Yeah. That's it. So he's. that's what's going on there. So these are the kind of things after the war. So I think the whole thing is really a non-event. Yeah. So that's the way I see it. I think it would be, I think it's uh, Cahill, U.S. Marshal. There's a... There's a scene where uh, John Wayne's got some prisoners and he's crossing a, a creek at a ford. And I guess the prisoners' gang members are on the other side and they want to take them back. And they've got their guns out and everything like that. And they meet in the middle and they have some words. And I forget how the words go, but eventually John Wayne looks at them and he realizes that these guys are full of shit and they're not going to do anything. And he goes, get the hell out of my way. And then just (laughs) (laughs) and then crosses over. I think that's what he would have said. Just get the hell out of my way. And and I'm sure that that was the uh, the sentiment there. So I think it's a it's a um, I I would also say that. um, But do you but now do you believe that that's how it went down or do you think that's being made up? That's all made up. That's all made up. Yeah, I think that's all made up. So what? How did it really go? I think whenever he he meets Howard, he says, you know, okay, I have got, of course, the papers. There, there are numerous. And Howard knows yeah. all the core commanders probably know mm-hmm. the orders Meade has been given that says I could do whatever I want, basically. Yes. Right. Yes. So I, Howard yeah. knows that they're operating under that. Yes. So yeah. he would be like, okay, yeah, you and got the written. Just let it go. Yeah. But I think uh, Hancock was being gracious. And splitting the responsibilities there. So that's true. Yeah, because okay. they, effectively that is what happened. Uh huh. You know. All right. So the, all right. 
uh, anything else on that subject? Or? Um, no, I just I just think that it's um, they try to ma- they make a bigger deal out of it than it really is. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Philip May. Now we got to Philip. Uh, I've always wondered how Hancock felt about saving Sickles' ass on July second. <laughs> I like how I don't read these ahead of time, so I get to be surprised. Uh, Meade kept peeling away troops from the Second Corps and sending them to the Peach Orchard. Uh, What did Hancock say about this on the record, either in his after-action reports or later interviews, letters, etc.? Please discuss Hancock's relationship with his division and brigade commanders in the Second Corps. Okay. All right. I I have... All right. Three... By the way... um, you might read four too because these are four. What? Oh, uh, Ty Webb's too. Oh, okay. And then Ty's got a similar question here, so we'll get Ty Webb in as well. There is a quote, or there is the quote Hancock makes about Sickles tumbling back after advancing to the Emmitsburg Road. Seems a somewhat subdued response for someone who just saw his southern flank open and is known to be one of the best cursors in the army. Do we know more about his initial response to Sickles' movement? Also, about how far south did Hancock eventually make it after being given command of the Third Corps? Uh, was July 2nd a time when a corps commander's uh, life does not count, or was that just on July 3rd? Okay, so okay. There's, we got a lot work. of stuff in there. we got two guys Yeah, let's, let's work backwards here. All right. Last question about uh, uh, there's a time. Corps commander, it, yeah. Yeah, that is um, actually on July 3rd during the cannonade. Um, however, the statement is suspect. Because it doesn't come along, it comes from a Captain Livermore in 1914, and then you try to place Captain Livermore on the field. I forget what staff he was with, some staff or something like that. Um, but it's hard to place him on that part of Cemetery Ridge at that time. Does he claim he heard it, or yes? Is, he claims, so he claimed he heard it with his own ears. Yes, but okay. he also has earlier writings and never mentions it. Ah. Okay? And it's very late. 1914 mm-hmm. is pretty late for this mm-hmm. quote. Mm-hmm. Okay. Although it is a cool quote. I like it. It's a great quote. Okay? I mean, I, I, I like the quote. But And then we touched on this, how far south did Hancock eventually make it after being given command? Uh, I would put him just north of the uh, George Weikert farm on Cemetery Ridge. Okay. It's a great quote, but now that I'm thinking about it... What? Go ahead. There are times when a corps commander's life does not count. Because he got to be seen by his men. No, I understand. I understand. But now that I think about it... That but leadership. It, but it does count. Because if he were to be cut down and his men were witnessing it, it's not like, ah, uh, it doesn't count. Well, They'd he, be is like, cut, he is cut down. <laughs> well, yeah, he is, right, exactly. So, I mean, that could be demoralizing. I guess... I guess it's just as moralizing as it is demoralizing yeah. to see him there. But, but I wouldn't say... At this time, I will say this. At this time, everything that, that I understand about these men, the granted, haven't been in combat. Nobody shot at me, um, at least that I know about. <sighs> and the idea of seeing... And this is from, of course, various accounts. I mean, once you're involved with this as long as I am, these things kind of come out. That you need to see your commander there with you. Sure. And the whole idea of him being on a horse and exposing himself to this, of course, insane fire, yes, that's very inspirational. Right. I mean, mean like, to the point of kind of like talk about getting the adrenaline flowing. That's the kind of thing that does it. That's that whole leadership thing that these men who are in this line of battle taking that fire need to see their commander do. I understand. But it's because his life counts. It's not because it doesn't count. No, because it, if, if it was some other corps commander who just happened to be visiting. Counting, it's about <laughs> that moment of leadership. I get it. But I'm, I just, no, uh, don't. I don't know. There's something about the quote that's not sitting right with me. Well, it's probably because it never happened. <laughs> <laughs> but it just sounds like one of those things. It's like too perfect, you know. Mm-hmm. To I, I don't know. I'll, I'll, I'll think about it. And next time I have you on, I'll have a better answer for you. Okay. All right. Go ahead. So on the whole... Um, uh, we touched on this about uh, his initial in our response. Discussion, yeah, on what he thought about saving Sickles' ass and the whole idea of kind of come tumbling back. That comes from Gibbon, by the way. Uh, whenever they mm. were on Kadori, the Kadori Knoll slash Hancock wounding Knoll, whatever you want to call it, 
But um, General Hancock, there's not a whole lot said about it other than this, and this comes from one of my uh, book recommendations, this guy here. I think he does a super job with a lot of different things, A.M. Gam- Gambone. I know that Gambone has uh, passed some years ago, but he did a lot of different uh, books with the uh, Butternut and Blue, and this is one of them. And this is uh, his assessment here. Hancock was not pleased with Meade's decision to give him the new assignment, that is, taking over Sickles' Third Corps. After the battle, the general commented, I never really exercised any command over any part of the Third Corps in action, save the fragments of General Humphrey's command. Hmm. Okay? Hmm. Because of this new appointment, Hancock dutifully turned the Second Corps back to General Gibbon. And according to Gibbon, Hancock was, here's a quote, uttering some expressions of discontent at being compelled at such a time to give up a command of one corps in a sound condition to take over a command of another that had gone to pieces. Uh, uh, so he probably was cursing there. <laughs> yes. So that's that's the sentiment that Hancock is going to give in the aftermath, if you will. Okay. All right. And then Philip's question about... Oh, I um, think I forgot something. No, I think you got it. No, I didn't. I forgot something. Uh, this is I got I did a very brief now this needs a lot more work uh, everybody but um, I did a very brief outline here on the different relationships between the other commanders because somebody asked about um, I forget who that was Philip May yes discuss Hancock's relationship with his division and brigade commanders in the second corps right all right. You want me to go down this list? Is that yes. okay? Okay. Very, this is all very, very brief here. So Meade and Hancock, uh, we talked about that. Um, you know, we're two and a half years here into the war. They have experience together as them both commanding different parts of the Army. So they knew each other well. They respected each other. Caldwell with, Han- with Hancock. So Caldwell's the 1st Division, Hancock's 2nd Corps. Um, he was, uh, this is a quote from different quotes. I, I, I could source the quotes, but I'm just going to read a couple of them here. He was quite a favorite among the boys. He was good natured, but nothing very brilliant about him. He was senior to Gibbon, but what happens? George Meade gives uh, Gibbon command of the uh, Corps, not Caldwell, even though he outranked him. Okay? Mm-hmm. So that tells you it's a lot right there. Now, um, let's go to the, the brigades in uh, Caldwell's division, 1st Brigade, Colonel Cross. He certainly knows Cross because he's going to wind up um, stopping Colonel Cross as after the prayer service is over with uh, Father Corby. He's the one who stops Cross and says that today, General, you're going to have your star. And Cross, of course, says, no, this is going to be my last battle. Yeah. So if he actually stops to recognize Cross at that point in time, he certainly knows of him and uh, had a relationship with him. Now, 2nd Brigade, Patrick Kelly. Okay, remember our whole Catholic thing with Father Corby? Um, I will say this, many of the um, accounts we have comes from uh, St. Clair Mulholland, the 116th Pennsylvania. Um, he's one of those writers who l- writes a lot about it, different things in the uh, Second Corps. And he, uh, first of all, Hancock permits them to have the prayer service. Okay, mm-hmm. think about this. Somebody as <clears throat> demanding, somebody as uh, having that commanding presence that General Hancock has is going to allow a few minutes for a quick prayer service. So that there is recognizing, of course, Kelly and, of course, the Irish Brigade. Third Brigade, Zook. Uh, Zook is actually a hometown friend of Hancock, okay? Oh. So their relationship goes all Good the way that. back before the war. And by the way, uh, we didn't touch on this, but uh, General Hancock is uh, one of those uh, well-versed in profanity, if you will. Yeah. Okay? And so is... Uh, John Zook. Wayne. <laughs> and so is Zook, okay? okay? Zook had that reputation as well. Now, 4th Brigade, Codwell's division here. Uh, this is uh, John R. Brooke. He had, uh, Hancock had spoke to him early on day three, complimenting his men, okay? And just before Hancock died, um, 1886, he does go to Washington to try to help uh, Brooke 
one of his old brigade commanders, an appointment uh, somewhere with the Army or somewhere in Washington or something mm-hmm. like that. So if he's going to go st- to on his behalf, of course, they have some type of relationship there. So my, my point is, b- by vast majority, these are all very good relationships yeah. b- with the other men. So let's go to Gibbon. Gibbon and Hancock, uh, no uh, question there. Well respected. They have warm feelings for each other. There's no issues with uh, George Meade placing Gibbon over Caldwell. We touched on that. First Brigade, Harrow. Harrow is a uh, brave and, and a competent regimental commander, but uh, commanding a brigade, he has no military background. He's in a law. He's one of the uh, lawyers. He's from Illinois, by the way. Kind of curious thing about uh, Harrow. Harrow rode on the Eighth Circuit in Illinois with Abraham Lincoln. Oh, okay. okay. So that's kind of one of those weird um, connection side stories, if you will. Yeah, yeah. That'd probably be cool. Maybe we could find some more detail about that. Second Brigade, Webb. Okay, this is where the brunt of Pickett's charge is going to happen. And, of course, uh, Wright as well on the second. Hancock is going to say about Webb. Of course, he knows the man. Um, Webb at one point is on General Meade's staff. He's got a military background. Just before uh, Gettysburg, uh, Owen, who commands Webb's brigade here at Gettysburg, is put under arrest because uh, I think um, Hancock or somebody didn't like something that— Owen did, and Webb, looking for a command, looking to get in the action, uh, Gibbon is going to give him command of the uh, 2nd Brigade, and that's why Webb is in charge there, the center part of the Union line. 3rd Brigade, Hall, he's a regular Army officer. He's praised by Gibbon after the battle, got a relationship there. 3rd Division, Hayes, remember I said early on, Hayes and Hancock are classmates at West Point in 1844, and Hayes is actually going to go visit General Hancock as Hancock's recovering there after, of course, the bullet goes into his... um, groinal region yeah and and then that's when uh hancock is uh asking about uh eliakim cheryl yes exactly that's and it. uh yeah cheryl's dead yeah just and, like and all hancock, your yeah just apologies. like all your apologies too damn late <laughs> <laughs> yeah all right all right carol um he's picked by hancock to assist howard on on east cemetery hill no uh we got respect there Smythe, uh, Colonel Smythe, he's experienced and brave. He's, he proved and commands very well until he's actually killed in action just before the end of the war. He, on April 7th, he winds up getting shot, uh, some people say, in the mouth, um, which would be awful because he's the last general to be killed um, for the Army of the Potomac, which is hmm. kind of sad there. Yeah. And then Willard, regular Army, U.S.-Mexican War, and, of course, Hancock joins him. Whenever he places him in position there, of course, Hancock or Willard winds up getting killed coming back up. All right. Uh, next guy we got here is Roy Meade, and he says in Fonce's Culp's Hill and Cemetery Hill book, he writes, Hancock sent some regiments over to Culp's Hill during the attack on July 2nd without a request for reinforcements. My question is, did Meade give Hancock the flexibility on the battlefield to make decisions like that without reporting to him? Or was Hancock more of the ask for forgiveness later type person? <laughs> That's the way I am. Yes, we know that. And so was John that. Wayne. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we touched on this a little bit. I would say this. Um, Hancock, of course, is going to have that leeway. Uh, Hancock had the instinctive, uh, on-the-spot style. And as things did quiet down, of course, on Hancock's front, which is the Cemetery Ridge line, he hears the roar on the other side. He's going to send Howard some help. Hancock was already already very familiar with that ground on East Cemetery Hill, and we hear a battle there. I'm going to send some help over. Again, mm-hmm. that's that whole leadership quality. You know, Things were okay here. They need the help over there. Yeah. And we he should, did. They did. Yeah, so, sure. Yeah. We should all have subordinates like Hancock, right? Oh, yeah. That'd be in, what a different things would be. Amazing. Oh. What? Yeah. Instead of people that go, well, that's not my job. Yeah. I hate that. Oh, my God. That drives me nuts. Yeah. It's like, no, it's not your job. Yeah. None of this is your job. You're fired. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Rich Snyder here. He's got an interesting question. Um, yeah, I don't know uh, this one. That's a new one. Oh, okay. Through various readings and accounts on earlier episodes of Ask the Gettysburg Guide, which is the greatest show ever, uh, and Matt is the greatest. Okay, enough. You don't need to go crazy there, Rich. Thank you, though. Uh, Hancock was described as a quick-tempered. He didn't write any of that, by the way. Uh, was described as a quick-tempered, profane commander. These same qualities 
qualities were prevalent in the Army of the Potomac commander, George Meade. What kind of relationship did these two generals share? Also, what is the best biography, if there is one, of Hancock? We, um, we, we're going to go over books mm. at the end here. So go ahead yeah. with that first one. That's the, uh, we, that stuff we already covered. Yeah. Obviously. <clears throat> well, but, these, but they have a – go ahead. They have that relationship built on experience in working together. Remember, say it again, we're uh, into the third year of war here already. These guys have already fought together. They already know each other's performance. They mm. already know what each other is capable for and how they can stand up, how they can take that initiative, do what needs to be done. Right. So the relationship is a very good one. He would have never been selected. Uh, he would have just told right. he would have just told whoever's in command of the, or Howard would have been in command. He would have just told Howard come back to the Pipe Creek, Creek line. He didn't do that. Mm -hmm. okay. What does he do? He's going to send um, Hancock again. He had just talked to Hancock about everything he was thinking about. That's why he gets sent up there. He obviously respected him enough to see if that ground is better to give battle. Then okay, let me let me know, and I'm going to send the whole damn yeah. army there. And that's exactly what happened. I like Meade. I, I think Meade like is Meade a great a commander. Yeah. Right? Yeah. He's a great leader uh you know and he, but not in like the hancock or custer kind of right. way where you you're you know conspicuous but he is a great manager of talent yes. i yes. guess is really the better way to put it he manages the talent beneath him very very well, well yes and he trusts them to do their thing he which lee the, does he trusts, too wait he trusts the ones he has the relationship well, with sure yeah okay <laughs> good point <laughs> um which and Lee does that too, but I think that the thing that hurts Lee here is that two of his three core commanders are brand new to core right. command, and he doesn't. Um, I don't want to say baby them, but he doesn't. Uh, uh, he tries. He tries to give the same discretionary style as he does with Longstreet. Yeah, but Problem. Longstreet and him have an experience. Right, they have that. They have it already yeah. together. Now Hill and um, Yule. Hill and Yule, they worked under Jackson. Right. Jackson didn't tell him crap except very explicit, right. very detailed instructions. You do this, this, and this, nothing else. Right. But I'm not telling you why. Right, right. Okay? Whereas now, Hill and Yule have to be able to have that discretionary uh, command style on their own, which they're like, they like short circuit. Yeah, it's, that takes some getting used to. Yes. It's not. Uh, I, that's what's amazing to me, and then, and I think to me that also shows how desperate of a situation Lee was in. Oh yeah, and that he undertook an invasion with a brand new organization of his army and two thirds of his corps commanders yeah. new to that job, and how many division commanders were new to that job? Oh, a good well, number, not a handful. Okay. Yeah, yeah, enough, so enough to cause problems. He's got a lot of untested corps commanders, and that's what happens. And they're in the. In those two corps that are not uh, that are commanded by the new corps commanders, yes. like Longstreet's got veterans. Yes, yeah. and so he's the only veteran corps. I, I will say this too: on the opposite side, Army of the Potomac has a lot of reorganizing going on as well. Where guys, sure. I mean, look look how many things we had just in, in the second corps alone. Yeah, yeah. Second yeah. corps itself. Yeah. You know, um, so you got that going on in both armies, and the problem is once you move into okay again. Third year of the war. We're into the third year of war, and then we have this attrition problem where you have guys who have been in command now are dead. Mm -hmm. And so just because somebody commanded a regiment well doesn't mean they can command a brigade. Yeah. And then so on and then so on. And then you get this cascading effect of uh, ineptness, if you will. And that's both sides experience that to a point. And that's why that whole relationship thing becomes so important. Mm-hmm. Like we saw, and Hancock has an incredible relationship with just about all of his uh, subordinates. Uh, and then we got Jason Slaughter, which I think is uh, a new name by me here. Uh, so he must be a new patron, or, or at least he is uh, sending a question in for the first time. Either way, welcome, Jason. And here's the question. I'm not sure if Mike is going to touch on his whole career or just Gettysburg. The answer is just Gettysburg. But let's see what you got here, Jason. Uh, but as a Virginia Peninsula resident just down the road at, from Williamsburg is where he earned the sobriquet. Is it sobriquet or sobriquet? I don't know. He The nickname, the superb. 
<laughs> the superb. Yes. His fight here was pretty famously frustrating. He was parked on the Confederate flank and denied reinforcements that could have posed a serious threat to Johnston's army and highlighted the Army of the Potomac's tendency to caution and timidity. Did Hancock ever write or talk about his frustrations during this battle or uh, this time in the army? How did this missed opportunity in 1862 affect his leadership and decision making for the remainder of the war, if at all? First of all, his command style is going to stay the same. He was always, always that natural leader, always quick to see what needed to be done. Um, the battle on May 5th there, uh, again, part of the Peninsula Campaign, you would have to go into one of the more detailed histories as far as that goes. The gist of what I understand about it is part of the Union Army had abandoned two uh, redoubts, uh, kind of like fortification type areas, and Hancock is going to move his men into there and then eventually lead a counterattack, which of course is going to push the Confederates back. So um, that leadership there, again... Um, kind of going against the grain, if you will, mm-hmm. going to a position that's already abandoned. Yeah, fearless, fearless. And he wants to win. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> he does want to win. He He's a USA, USA guy all the way, you know, the whole preserve the union thing. Most people's styles don't change right. with promotion. Uh, the style is always there. It's the opportunity to show it that changes to we, the observers. Yes. In other words, yes, you know I what agree. I mean? Mm-hmm. Like Hancock was always Hancock, but he didn't get a chance to show that he was Hancock until the opportunity came up. Like Grant is a better example. Mm. Failed at everything in the civilian yeah. world, you know, and everything. but a great army commander. Mm. But he had to get there yeah. first before we could see. Yeah. But Grant was always Grant. That was always in him. Yeah, and and again, Hancock, I think, has always been excellent on the battlefield. Yeah. He's just one who excelled. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he's magic on the mic. He was a rapper at the time. I don't know what that is. A rapper? What? You don't know what a rapper is? No. A guy who raps. Magic on the mic. You know, he's... I'm something on the floor and a magic on the mic. In in other words, Uh, I'm a good... Oh, never mind. I think, I don't know what that, is that, you can't touch this? I don't remember. But anyway, so uh, that's it. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you to, to books. What? Oh. oh, oh yeah. That's it for the questions. But Mike's got some book recommendations here for okay. you. All right. So number one, over, what do we got? Over, overall action. Yeah. Okay. You got Fawn, second day. Yep. Uh, best biography, David M. Jordan, Winfield Scott Hancock, A Soldier's Life. All right. I think that's the best biography. Okay. Now, specifically, uh, Gettysburg stuff. There's This is a mix of all kinds of different things. This is a... Uh, what the heck is his first name? I forgot his first name. Winfield. No. Oh. It just says A.M. Oh, the author yeah. you're talking about. A. I'm going to say is either Alfred or Albert. Let's say Aaron. But it's no, Aaron. But there's not nothing. Aaron. It doesn't say. All right. It doesn't say. All right. Anyway, what? This is an older book um, done by Butternut and Blue. Butternut and Blue had gone. Um, they retired, went out of business some time ago. But nonetheless, Hancock at Gettysburg and Beyond. A. M. Gambone. G. A. M. B. O. N. E. This is part of Butternut and Blue's Army of the Potomac series. A lot of the Army of the Potomac series have been out of print for many years, but I do believe this one was in a paperback too, so it should still be be available. All right. I'm trying to see. I just Googled it to see if maybe. No, everything just says AM. Gambon. Well, well, let's just call him Albert. I like Albert for him. You so it's Albert Gambon. Why can't you just say AM? Because I got to know what the A stands for. It doesn't matter. It says AM on the book. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just find it weird that they don't have his full name in there. So do I. I, I can't believe I didn't look. Through. Yeah. Let me see. AM Gambon, AM Gambon. No, this is annoying. What a bunch of jerks. Well, whatever. The point is, Mr. Gambone uh, wrote yeah. wrote that book. Yeah. So Hancock at Gettysburg and Beyond by M. Gambone, Winfield Scott Hancock, A Soldier's Life, and Harry Fonts' second day uh, uh, book there. All right. Well, that's it for us. Thank you very much, Mike, for coming. Great job. You're I had welcome. a lot of fun today. And now it's nap time. Nap Actually, time. now it's dinner time. All right. I'm going to go home and make a steak on my new uh, grill. Hibachi. No, no, I got this great, it's like a Foreman grill, mm-hmm. right? 
Except, you know, you say, uh, I'm going to have steak. So I turn it on. I press the button that has a picture of steak on it. <laughs> and, it and it proof. heats it up. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, theoretically, I've already screwed it up. But... And it heats it up, and it's got a light that changes color as it gets to the different stages of cook. So rare is like yellow, ah. medium is like a mid orange, and cool. then and then uh, well done is Does like it work red. Well? Does it work? I'm telling you, listen. I have had the best steaks I've ever cooked in my life, and salmon and chicken. It cooks it perfectly. Wow. I mean, perfectly. It is fantastic. You have to flip and, it. And by the way, you in minutes, it. no, because it's 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 like wow. a panini press. So uh, it literally takes less than five minutes to cook uh, a steak. Very nice. Oh my god, it's the greatest thing. And it was only like maybe two hundred dollars yeah. on Amazon. Wonderful, best best thing ever. So I'm going to go home and make a, a steak in a couple of minutes because that's why I don't cook at home because it takes too long. Yeah. But now that problem is solved. Uh, so anyway, the, the, this has nothing to do with the show. People don't care about this stuff. The point is, thank you very much for coming on. You're welcome. Thank you to our patrons for sending in the questions. And of course, thank you to all of you who listen. Um, hope to see your names over there on Patreon very soon. So many exciting things going on at Patreon. That's where the fun is, ladies and gentlemen. That's where the fun is. We'll talk to you next time. Thank you. Before we actually end here uh mike came by the day after we recorded this episode and uh he was he was beside himself because he forgot to um uh, uh print this out what i'm about to read to you and um he wanted to include it uh in the show to answer some of the questions about mead's relationship with hancock um this is a letter from Brevet Colonel George Meade, George Meade's son, uh, to Hancock's widow. And uh, let's see, it looks like, uh, probably, well, I don't know, it doesn't have a date on it. So anyway, uh, this is just an excerpt from it here. Uh, so here we go. On the very first occasion when I saw General Hancock, the circumstance is so intimately associated with General Meade's admiration of him that it affords the most fitting introduction to this brief mention. The scene was in camp in 1862, soon after the Battle of Fredericksburg, where these two intrepid soldiers, each at the head of his division, had gallantly stormed those terrible hills held by the enemy. Hancock on the right at Maurice Heights, and Meade on the left at Hamilton's Crossroad. I was standing near General Meade when General Hancock rode up, and after exchanging cordial greetings with General Meade, and lingering for a few moments on the spot, dashed away at full speed. His bearing was so striking that it would have prompted anyone ignorant of who he was to inquire, and I well remember with hearty intonation of voice with which General Meade replied to my question, Why, don't you know who that is? Why, that's Hancock. These were truly brothers in arms. If in the future that lay before them, in the gnawing anxieties of the long-continued civil conflict, their relations, as is sometimes unavoidable in such vicissitudes of life, ever were subject to strain. Now, if you know what that means, you're a step ahead of me. I feel sure that at the bottom, their regard for each other as noble spirits, gallant gentlemen, and soldiers suffered no abatement. At least I can answer for General Meade's, and I think that we would all be ready to swear that the noble nature of Hancock would not have permitted his to have changed. So, there you go. Hancock the Superb, as observed by George Meade's son. Um, and uh, I hope that helps. Thanks for listening. Hey everyone, before you go, I would like to highlight a friend and supporter of the show, The Badge Maker, your source for authentic Civil War Corps badges and more. Purchase handcrafted, historically accurate Civil War Corps badges from all Corps. Discover a vast collection of military and civilian insignias of various kinds. Experience the exclusive service of custom hand-stamped reproduction ID discs. At his website, CivilWarCorpsBadges.com, The Badge Maker brings history to life with precision and passion. Our hearts so stout have got us in for soon to from whence we came. Wherever we go, they dread the name of Gary Owen and glory. Instead, it's followed, drink down.